um, 2017 Twin Falls City Council meeting. We are starting an hour early to start on our MPOG process. For those of you that aren't aware, MPOG is for Municipal Powers Outsource Granting, and it is a fund that we have in the city where we can help nonprofits who offer services to the city of Twin Falls that as a city we could offer but do not. So it's our way of partnering with you and thanking you for what you do to help us as city council members and as a city of Twin Falls. So we will come back to our normal beginning with public comment and the Pledge of Allegiance when we start the regular portion of our meeting. And right now we're going to jump right into the MPOG process. And we're asking that each of the applicants take up to five minutes to introduce themselves and tell us what we need to know about your group and what you're requesting of us. And then the council will weigh in if they have any questions at that time. And we'll try to get through all 15 applications as quickly as we possibly can. So with that, the first one on my list today is the Boys and Girls Club. Hmm. Hello there. Welcome. Thank you for having us. Um, Lindsay, we're going to make sure that they get the time started on the board there. Okay. And then Ruth Pierce has the time cards, and she'll give you a two-minute and a 30-second warning just to keep things moving. So as soon as you see the time come up there, then go for it. Okay, there go ahead. Go. Okay, hi, I'm Lindsay Westberg. I'm the Executive Director of the Boys and Girls Club of Magic Valley. Again, thank you for having us here today. Uh, it's been an honor to be the Executive Director for the club for now four years. I've been a part of the club for 13 years, so I've definitely seen the impact that the club has on the community and the need that there is for the club in the community. Um, our club is open for 14 to 16 per hours a day Programs at the club benefit all children in our community. Kids who need us most can be kids with two working parents, children who come from single parent homes, children who live with grandparents, homeless children. We turn no families away. The Boys and Girls Club are providing a safe and positive environment for thousands of kids to attend before and after school. We serve over 3,000, we served over 3,000 youth in 2016. 1,798 of those kids are from Twin Falls. 65% of those kids qualify for free or reduced lunch. These kids would otherwise be going home to no parental su supervision. This is also referred to as the danger zone from 3.30 to 6.30 p.m. when children would be going home without any parental supervision. Um, the club is there for kids that can't be involved in sport, sports or don't make the team. Um, in the Twin Falls School District, uh, there are Uh, 6,626 kindergarten through 8th grade students. The club is serving only 275 kids per day. Um, the need for our organization is growing and our programs and opportunities for Twin Falls youth has never been so urgent. Uh, with me today um, is Cassidy Littleton. Cassidy is our 2017 uh, Youth of the Year and a and she's going to talk to you a little bit about what the club programs can offer and what the, the club programs have offered for her. Uh, we come to you today asking for funds uh, for three recreational programs, um, fitness, art, and music and drama programs. These programs uh, will, will offer programming for 120 diff different youth during our after school program. The fitness program will teach club members about the vital importance of healthy lifestyles, physical fitness, and the values of teamwork. Uh, we also encompass um, how to eat right, how to, how to live a healthy lifestyle. So what we're teaching these kids is, is lifelong, li lifelong hobbies and habits to, to help, help them live a better lifestyle. Our art program, uh, we will collaborate with several local artists to teach club members different techniques to create and appreciate a variety of different arts. Um, this can be anything from 
uh, sketching to music to theater and drama um, all different mediums of art and not only do we bring people from the community into the club to teach our students about art but we also take our kids out um, this last year we actually took our students out to CSI um, to tour um, the, th the theater and arts program we like to get our kids out into the community and involved in what's going on um, in our performing arts uh, we plan to uh, put on a play with our with our members we also did that this year um, we also incorporated music which um, includes everything from teaching them piano to um, creating a production so that's what we plan to do and we ask that you support these programs because they are programs that uh, align with uh, the City of Twin Falls 2030 strategic initiatives when it involves youth and keeping them off the street, healthy lifestyles, providing lifelong learning programs, developing education programs tr to address drug use, violence and bullying, and educating youth in community service and civic engagement. Each one of these programs from art to fitness to theater, all of that is encompassed in all of the programs that we're providing. So. With that being said, I'd like to introduce Cassidy, our 2017 uh, Youth of the Year, and she's going to talk to you a little bit about what the club has done for her. Thank you. Hi. I have been a club member at the Boys and Girls Club here in Magic Valley now for 10 years. Um, I am also part of our club alumni program, and I am the state ambassador for all Boys and Girls Clubs of the state of Idaho. Um, I also help run a Keystone Club through the Boys and Girls Club, which is a program that helps to bring teens into the Boys and Girls Club to build community relationships and partnerships, um, and also encourage academic health and really support um, career lifestyles and college goals. So just um, as part of a consideration, um, just to remember that as a teenager and a girl who was growing up in a rough um, past in a family home that this was a place that really provided community and helped strengthen my own core values so that when I got to the age of being an adult I didn't want to resort to bad habits or um, unhealthy lifestyles and it really is a secondary community for families and children in the Magic Valley. Do you have any questions? Okay, Ruth Pierce. So I happen to be geeky so I looked at everybody's financials and all the um, stuff that was provided by Mandy. And I noticed that you had a pretty healthy sum of cash. Like if my notes are right, like over 400000 And so I'm kind of wondering why you're reaching out for a $16,000 grant. If, and I don't know if it's restricted. I, you know, I don't know. But it was really hard to tell. So... Um, the 400000 part it is restricted, um, and that was partially from a project that we did last year uh, where we built the homes, and that money is going into our endowment, so it is restricted. Chris Talkington? I want to make sure I understand uh, the 275 kids that you <coughs> are applying the money toward. Mm -hmm. Are they primarily Twin Falls City residents? Yes, so 89% are Twin Falls residents. 89%. So out of, yes. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Any other questions from the council? I don't see any at this time, but stay close by because I have a feeling we're not done. Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you very time. much. The request is for sixteen thousand five hundred. No, I made my own. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> okay. Okay. Next on our list is Casa. Hello. Thank you for having me. My yes. My name is Tana Barton. My name is Tana Barton, and I'm the executive director of the 5th Judicial District CASA program, covering in all eight counties. Um, our program is tasked by the judges to go out and independently investigate the situations that bring children into the child protection um, purview. We then go out um, 
in the Twin Falls area last year in the, in the city of Twin Falls, we had 205 children that we represented. These are 205 children that at some time were determined to be in imminent danger and removed from their homes and put into foster care. Our volunteers went out and we had enough to um, represent 143 of those. 62 did not have a volunteer, but with that, the children that did have a volunteer had somebody to look out for them. They had somebody to talk to the doctors, talk to the teachers, talk to everybody that's involved in their life and come to a, a determination as to what they feel is in that child's best interest. Our children should have parents that do this, but when they're unwilling or unable to do that, the child protection system is there and the state of Idaho is a little ill-equipped to raise children. Our volunteers step in and kind of make those parents thoughts like a child that has been abused um, you would think that it would be pretty standard that they would receive counseling but that's not always it. We sometimes have to re um, go to the judge and ask for counseling to be ordered in that child's life. We sometimes will advocate that they receive extra services such as the Boys and Girls Club or the services of um, teachers and other providers. Our volunteers spend hours working on these cases and they typically only have one or two cases. When a social worker has, on the average, um, according to the OPE report, they have an average of 13 cases and have a 38% overload of what is normal. So these children deserve this um, and they need it. So this year we're asking for another 15 additional volunteers to be trained in the city of Twin Falls to represent the children of Twin Falls and ensure that their best interests are met in the court. We're asking for a total of $6,641 in order to accomplish that. Chris Talkington. Again, back to the numbers, if <coughs> 205 children might be served, uh, what percentage of those be Twin Falls City, please? 205. Thank you. We represented 480 children last year. 205 were City okay. of Twin Falls. Thank you. Does anyone else have any questions at this time? Looks like you're getting off easy tonight. I am. Thank you. <laughs> I appreciate that. Thank you. Next on the list is Interlink Volunteer Caregivers. Edie Shab. Well, I want to thank you for your past support, and especially last year. Um, many of you know that we took over the Office on Aging Senior Transportation Program, and the 10000 that you gave us for volunteer mileage reimbursement really helped. Um, so a primary unmet need. Um, addressed by IVC is non-Medicaid funded transportation. Um, IVC volunteers using their own vehicles provide transportation to elderly, disabled, and chronically ill people who cannot drive, so they have access to their health care providers. Providing people access to health care allows them to remain independent while living in their homes, saves the taxpayers by preventing costly ambulance rides, preventing costly long-term hospitalizations, keeps them out of care facilities, and our access to health care transportation program contributes to a healthier community which aligns with your strategic plan. Um, partnerships. All of the agencies that IVC collaborates with are listed in our application. The list is numerous. Um, IVC partners with many area organizations in order to stretch our resources as far as possible. Uh, we strive to be the agency of last resort uh, if there are other resources or agencies that we can refer a person to, we do that uh, to ensure there are no duplication of services. Due to our positive working partnership, as I said before, the Office on Aging transferred its senior transportation program to IVC in October of 2015. As they were told by their main funder, they could no longer provide transportation as a direct service. IVC is now the only organization in southern Idaho providing no-cost door-through-door transportation to all eight counties of the Magic Valley. Door-through-door real quick means 
If needed, our volunteers assess, assist them by going inside, gathering their belongings, helping them outside, helping them to get in the car, walking them into their medical appointment, staying with them if that's what they need them to do. Um, again, walking them back out to the car and walking them into the house. Um, IVC is projecting for 2017. We will transport Twin Falls City residents 146,000 miles to health care providers. We will serve 4,972 Twin Falls City residents with transportation to medical appointments and grocery shopping. 69% of all elderly, disabled, and chronically ill people served will be Twin Falls City residents. 86% of all miles driven are coming into Twin Falls. Um, so our request, um, as you can see on the application, is for 15,960. Of the 146,000 miles projected at the mileage reimbursement rate of 46 cents per mile, IVC has secured 50,800 of that. That's our match. Is my time up? No. Oh, sorry, it was covered. <laughs> Through other sources. That leaves, as I said, our request, 15,960. Those funds will cover 34,696 miles of transportation. Any and all funds awarded to IVC will go directly to volunteer mileage reimbursement. We have everything else taken care of. Um, if time permits, really quick, and I do, I have a minute 18. For those of you that don't know, Chris, you're new. Um, IVC, the other services we provide, we're not here asking for those funds, but we have a um, home modification program, so we build and install wheelchair ramps and grab bars, um, keep people safe. Um, we provide housekeeping chores and meal prep. Um, we do some friendly visiting to those that are homebound. We provide respite care for those that are taking care of their loved ones in their home, give them a little break. And we do yard maintenance, snow removal, and simple home repairs. And that's it. <laughs> Questions? Wow. Wow. That's I either think you really hit it out of the or, park. Or yeah. really bad. But no. thank you very much. Thank you very much for your presentation. <coughs> Next is Jubilee House. Hi, I'm Barbie Danson. Thank you for your patience. We are um, learning new software. This is cool. <laughs> B-A-R-B-I-E. Danson is D-A-N-S-O-N. With the Jubilee House. We got it. You can go. Hi, thank you so much. We would like to express, express our deep gratitude for you and for the support of Twin Falls so far. Um, I am with the Jubilee House. I am the community outreach coordinator there, and we are a 12-month recovery home for women whose lives have been devastated by drugs and alcohol. Um, drugs and alcohol is not only a personal thing for many people, but it is a global problem. It is a city problem. And what we do is we reach out to these women. Um, a lot of them come from uh, the judicial system. There, a lot of them are incarcerated. We bring them into our home. We keep them for 12 months, and we work with them to um, uh, kind of uh, change uh, their lives by um, more than just quitting the drugs and alcohol, but to learn how to um, change their behavior and how they respond to life issues. Um, these women come to us um, with a whole lifetime of lies. They've been told that they're not good enough. They've been told that they're ugly. They've been told that they're worthless. And we have to start from the very beginning, from the root of things, to change those lies so that at that point they can start learning good quality tools to take out in the community and become self-sufficient again. So um, with the, um, the girls that stay with us, we do not charge them. And this part of this 
uh, reasoning is because we want them to be able to come in and focus completely on their recovery. They are not allowed to work until almost nine months into the program, and that is because we have found that if we keep them in the program, in classes, structure, going to other facilities to learn, we have a... Um, counselor that uh, that stays on the facility with them through the week working with them and um, we take them to all of their meetings a lot of them are still involved in um, the health courts and um, and then we take them to their medical appointments that they have to have um, we take them to meet with their parole officers so we work with them through um, their recovery in their daily lives and uh, this gives that, us an opportunity to love on them and encourage them and to help them. We do not accept um, government grants. Uh, we, uh, we cannot accept health insurance. So we run off of donations from private organizations. And um, so because we are faith-based and we feel that this is an important aspect of our house, we find that um, with the women going through this program with learning um, from the inside, from spiritual aspect, that it changes and it is a lot more, um, we see a lot more women staying clean and sober through this aspect of, of learning than just going into a um, recovery facility that costs lots of money and learning for 30 days how to stay sober because they've been watched that whole time and then they go out the door and they relapse. In fact, most of our girls are relapsed um, from going to very <laughs> um, costly uh, recovery programs. So um, last year we kind of struggled in our finances. We did have the Beyond Recovery Life Center. We did have to close that facility down and concentrate only on the house. And we had to um, not shut our doors, but we weren't allowed to bring women in for about three months. And that was the hardest part of my job I've ever had to do was when the phone rang and it was somebody wanting to put an application in to tell them, I'm sorry, we are not accepting applications at this time. So right now, we have five women in the home and we have seven women that are in court trying to work at getting out to come into the house. And we probably have about 10 more applications sitting on the counter that we have to wait until the courts decide who can come and who can go before we can um, go on further. But we plan on getting 10 women in there as soon as possible so that we can get going full board again. So do you have any questions? Chris Talkington. Uh, Barbie, you admitted, or not admitted, you addressed the high-risk population you're dealing with, relapse. Uh, do, you do you track one and two years out for relapse recidivism? They have, and I, um, I know that at the, out of the last group of girls that graduated, out of five, we had one that relapsed, and that is about average for us. Uh, what time period of measuring? Uh, m well, this, this young gal, um, she was probably about three months out before she relapsed. But the others have all, you know, we, I have girls that, um, that from that group that are five, five years, no, no, three years into recovery already. One of them is working at um, the, the school district. Uh, um, we have two at hotels in the area here. And what's really cool is these women actually were the ones that came from out of the area, and they live here now. And they have brought their families here to live here. And so I think that's kind of cool that we're bringing people into different balls too. Thank you. Greg Lanting. <laughs> are, uh, are Twin Falls residents and how many come from out here? 80% is what they figure are Twin Falls residents. Thank yes. I do have a question. You said that um, you don't take government grants, but this is a type of a government grant. So how does that work? Um, because we fall into the qualification for this grant without you guys overseeing as far as our program. So you don't come in and tell us how to run the program gotcha. that we know works. So most of them, they have a say on what goes on inside the house, and so we have to step away from that. Thank you for clarifying. 
Any other questions? Looks like we're good. Thank Great. you very Thank much. Thank you. Link Network. Tanya Holland. Okay, I'm Tanya Holland with Living Independent Network Corporation, which is abbreviated for LINK. Um, we do in-home health care for elderly and disabled people. Um, the transportation program is what we're trying to get the grant for. What we do is we transport, we help transport the elderly and seniors to doctor's appointments, um, the stores, grocery stores, to keep them in their homes. Um, we're just looking at more money to help them um, so we can up more people. Right now we currently have about 400 people that we can help. Um, and there's just, there's even more. I keep getting applications in every day to do more. Um, so we just need, and it's a program where we give them six rides a month um, and they can do whatever they need with that. And we work with Office on Aging, Transfer, and we also work with Interlink Volunteer Caregivers um, to help us out around town too. Um, and we just need to enhance the program. So if we have that a little bit more of that funding, we can enhance the program and get it out there more so that more of the seniors can come and get more help and more rights. Um, Cause six rights is just, not enough for a lot of them. A lot of them want, need that more, especially for the whole month. Um, and we work in the Twin Falls area. We're also doing a uh, mini Casha area too. So we need more people up there. Um, and then we do all around Kimberly, Buell, Jerome. Um, most of our people are from the Twin Falls County though. Chris Talkington. I didn't see a specific amount though that you had requested from us. Um, we're asking for 5,000. Okay, well, thank you. Ruth Pierce. So again, me being geeky, I looked at the financials and it looks like you have close to $700,000 in cash. Is that all restricted? Is it one step, from one of your other facilities? It was, it's from one of our other facilities. We have um, three different facilities. We have um, one here in Twin, and then we have um, Boise, and then we have Caldwell. And that money is actually for the Living Independent Work Corporation. Um, most of our funding comes from ITD. So the 5000 that we're asking from is pretty much 5% of what we get from ITD to help out with. Um, the 700000 is actually restricted okay. to do not very much. <laughs> Any other questions? Suzanne, this is Sean. I have a question. Okay, go ahead, Sean. Sorry, I forgot to ask you that, earlier. That's quite all right. Um, so help me understand the difference between LINK and Interlink Volunteer Caregivers and Transfor and how someone who needs these services figures out which one of you to go to. Well, they, um, most of the time, the ones that we have that come to us um, are the ones that need um, rides all the time. The ones that we take to Interlink Volunteer care Caregivers, those are the ones that um, are not able to be on our transportation program. Um, we do 65 and older and people with disabilities that are not allowed to drive on our transportation program. So other ones that call us, if we can't help them, we send them to the other ones. Um, with Transfor, they're one of our providers, so they take our link card. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anyone else need any follow-up to that? Thank you very much. You. Magic Valley Arts Council. Carolyn White. Okay, as the official arts organization for the city of Twin Falls, we feel our main objective is to provide art and cultural opportunities to all citizens of our community. 
Our most recent effort was evidenced in the success of this year's most recent Art and Soul, a true community-wide event. This past Saturday night, we handed out a huge economic stimulus to 27 artists. So you don't have to ask later. Please make a note that P&L that I included in my packet is not looking quite as healthy as it did. The Arts Council goals strongly mirror the city's strategic plan and mission in maintaining a strong and, and enriched cultural and entertainment infrastructure. We work closely with and partner with many other arts organizations, nonprofits, citizen groups, and city ad hoc art committees to further that goal. We believe in providing strong arts educational opportunities to our citizens, especially our youth. This past year, we reached over 3,000 students locally, and we know that the arts provide and support economic growth to this city. I heard that at a minimum, three pickup trucks recently used just to display art entries in the Art and Soul contest sold, right out from underneath the art. We strive to continue to provide art exposure and opportunities to everyone, but particularly, again, to our youth at no or very low and reduced costs. Kids Art in the Park in its 26th year, reaching over 350 kids, is still only $2 per child. We know that most of the families we reach with this program fall into that almost 65 percentile qualifying for free or reduced lunch programs in our local schools. Students exposed and engaged in the arts statistically have a better chance of staying in school, off drugs, and out of trouble. They show improvement in self-confidence, develop friends, have better concentration, and even improve math skills. Our programming is varied and wide, and we continue to, to develop and grow as the needs and opportunities uh, arise and to help enhance the growth of our city and make it a better place to live. We still need your help. We hope that you will continue to recognize the importance of the arts that the arts bring to our community, and we want to thank you in advance for your support. Questions? Boy, we're a quiet bunch tonight. Can you believe it? Gosh, I know. So I, I think that's all for this time. Okay. Chris, you're not going to ask me how many kids are from Twin Falls? Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I added it up. We actually reached 2,400 of the 3,000 because I did take one program to uh, Jerome for 600 kids about two weeks ago. So. I knew you wouldn't disappoint me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Magic Valley Symphony. I'm Amy Toft. Yes, it's the first time I've ever done this. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Amy Toft with the Magic Valley Symphony. Thank you for listening to our grant request. I know you have many proposals to read, so I'm going to briefly summarize our idea. I think it's good to be clear on the numbers right away. We are asking for a very tiny part of your municipal powers outsource grant budget, only $5,000. This would pay for music purchase and rental for our season. So our music purchase budget is $1,500 and rental is 1000 we just weigh which would be the best deal, and that's how we decide what to do. You know, when there's lots of instruments, there's lots of music that you need. Um, and also, this would allow, so it's sort of two parts. That's one part, and I'm kind of done talking about that. Um, also allow the city of Twin Falls to sponsor a concert, and our sponsor a concert fee is $2,500, so total is five. Now, let me just say a tiny bit about the Magic Valley Symphony. We're a full orchestra of volunteer musicians from southern Idaho. We give scholarships to local youth, and we present four concerts a year. 
Magic Valley Symphony has been playing together since 1959. <coughs> the musicians are a diverse group in age, employment, country of origin, religion, politics, and sexual identity, and so is our audience. Music brings people together like nothing else. We strive to keep our music excellent, affordable, and welcoming to all. Now, we do provide a service that is not provided by local government. We give the people of Magic Valley the opportunity to perform and listen to beautiful music that unites them. So when we think about people with no homes and people with no food, sometimes we think, oh, music, that's, we can cut that off. But if you can only imagine if all you had to do was go to work and come home and never have anything beautiful in your life, um, our ticket sales would not begin to pay for any of our concerts ever. We're fully, almost fully funded by um, grants and local contributors, which our local contributors are excellent. The service the Magic Valley Symphony provides is directly related to the city's strategic plan and mission statement. Classical music has been shown to improve school test scores, allowing young people to participate in good music and learn to appreciate it, helps make Twin Falls a learning community. We know that learning doesn't stop after school is completed, so appreciating good music is a lifelong way to keep our minds sharp. We recycle our program booklets for our entire season, thus helping us be an environmental community. Studies have shown that a vibrant arts community is attractive to new business. Cultural opportunities enhance the city's image. This helps us support Twin Falls as a prosperous community. And our partnerships, um, we partner with CSI, local schools, the med, um, and the schools, we gave a concert ticket to every fourth grader in the Twin Falls School District and also an accompanying adult this year. And we plan to do that every year. Uh, Magic Valley Corral and the Twin Falls City Band and many local businesses and community members. Now, the plan. What we will do if you sponsor this concert. I'm so excited about this. The Magic Valley Symphony can help Twin Falls become a welcoming and neighborly city by giving concert tickets, um, and this is just for one concert, our April 27, 2018 concert, to immigrant and refugee families and individuals. We will partner with the CSI Refugee Center to coordinate rides and provide friends to attend the concert with refugees. We would devote an entire concert to this. The City of Twin Falls will be prominently featured in advertising and at the concert itself. Perhaps the mayor and city council members would like to conduct the symphony or do something else at the concert, like be an usher. <laughs> <laughs> um, immigrants could give a demonstration of instruments, singing or dancing during the intermission. This, um, the CSI Refugee Center will have a display in the lobby showcasing places our refugees <coughs> come from. They will have staff on hand to answer questions. We will have refreshments after the concert and this will give newer and more seasoned Twin Falls residents a chance to meet and learn about each other. Magic Valley Symphony is proud to represent the city of Twin Falls and its surrounding area. Ours is a wonderfully vibrant community seeking to grow and be better each year. The Magic Valley Symphony's goals are similarly aligned. Thank you for considering our grant request. Questions? <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> any questions? I don't see any lights on up here. Hi. Oh, Suzanne, go. I have a question. <laughs> go ahead, Sean. So Amy, thank you for your presentation. Thank you. So a uh, question for you. The, since you're a new uh, applicant this year, yes. have, you, have you done the same number of concerts and types of programs in the past, or would this be, would these funds help to grow the symphony's presence? Um, no, it, we, it will still have the same number of concerts. We still will do four per year, but this special April concert would be a most excellent partnership between the Refugee Center, the City of Twin Falls, and the Magic Valley Symphony. And many, many times we'll go somewhere to ask for money and people will say, I didn't know Twin Falls had a symphony. And um, that's what we're working on changing. Great, thank you. And what piece would you like to conduct? <laughs> it's been a long time since I conducted in band. <laughs> many, many years ago. Thank you very Thank much. You. Orton Botanical Garden. Is it possible to put up a map? 
Mandy should be able to help you there. You'll we'll have to turn off the oh. other one. Chris is going to do some backup timing up here, I think, for you since we have the map up there and we can't see the timer on the wall. So listen to these guys to my left here, and they'll tell you when you're done. Thank you. Uh, my name is Lamar Orton. I live at 867 Filer Avenue West. Uh, I am the president of Orton Botanical Gardens, an IRS-approved 501c3 nonprofit corporation. We have a board of directors of 10 members. Um, most of which have experience with botanical gardens. Uh, Orton Botanical Gardens is a five-acre garden and demonstrates um, over 400 species and varieties of plants, many native to Idaho. Most are drought tolerant. It is, it is the mission of Orton Botanical Gardens to demonstrate, educate, and to conserve. Uh, we demonstrate succulents that can withstand uh, cold, uh, very cold temperatures educate people of all ages about cold hardy succulents, native and drought tolerant plants, and their importance in the natural and human environment. Encourage water conservation through the demonstration of arid landscaping. In addition to many individual visitors to the garden, um, uh, many of which are from, from Twin Falls, we also have garden clubs, native plant organization, master gardeners, grade school, high school, and university classes uh, that have come to the garden. We have had classes with the Forest Service, BLM, and Idaho Fish and Game representatives at the garden. There have been visitors from Germany and Austria, as well as over uh, 10, from 10 states. And uh, well, this year, the garden schedule already includes participating in a local master gardeners program receiving a busload of gardeners and botanists from Boise, hosting a class for BLM representatives, conducting a class on plants <laughs> for young children for the Salvation Army, and hosting the Pocatello chapter of Idaho Native Plant Society. This morning, actually at noon today, we hosted a, a scout group, um, and then we will do that um, again Wednesday where we have another group of about 15 um, scouts coming. The garden is in transition from a private garden to a public garden. Um, uh, we can we can take this down. I just want to show you. Uh, let me just see if I've got to work on that. Um, the the large central area there is a demonstration on drought tolerant uh, grasses that uh, we mow once a year. We water it about six times a year maximum. The outlined area um, at the bottom. And the lower part on left and right is a is a windbreak, and then the other berms include all drought tolerant plants. Um, is uh, the the garden is in is in transition in transition from a private garden to a public garden in November. Uh, 2015, IRS approved our 5013C status. In March of this year, we received a special use permit for, from the city that recognizes the garden as a botanic garden and not just a private <coughs> backyard. The garden's board of directs, uh, directors wishes to improve the garden's accessibility and services to the community. The most immediate need is to establish regular visitors' hours um, rather than requiring appointments at all times except for two weekends in May and a Christmas light display in December. The garden charges no fee to enter the garden. We are um, sustained by plant sales and donations from the garden. Um, in our application, we have asked uh, for 25000 after hearing the many others today. <laughs> we realize that that's probably uh, hi, um, uh, whatever you can do for us, we would appreciate. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Are there any questions? For I don't see any lights. Thank you very much. Safe house. Hi, 
My name is Val Stotts. I am the program director of the Safe House. Um, I've had the privilege of being there for over 19 years, and um, this is our first time applying for this grant, so it's a really exciting uh, time for us. Um, the Safe House is a local state licensed youth group home for boys and girls ages 11 to 17. Um, our program, we do um, place kids there who have been referred through Child Protective Services, um, the juvenile justice system, and just families in the community that are struggling that need our services. In particular, this grant that we're applying for is to continue to offer services to our local city officers for a place for them to place youth who don't necessarily qualify to be placed in detention, uh, but they need some additional assistance. So our officers are able to place the youth at the safe house for usually up to four hours, depending on the situation. And then it gives us the opportunity to contact the parents and then offer our services. Sometimes more is going on than what's really um, on the surface. So that allows us to meet with the family, to meet with the youth, and see what kind of services that we can offer. Sometimes kids end up staying there longer. Um, sometimes our kids are there for several days, several weeks, or several months. Um, so this grant gives us the opportunity to continue offering those services that we've actually been offering um, since we've opened. Um, the nice thing, too, about the Safe House is not only do we offer services to our youth, but we partner with so many programs in the community. A lot of them <laughs> here today, so it's like a reunion um, mm. when, when I was here. Um, but that's the, the great part of it is that not only are our kids in the safe house, but then we put them in touch with a lot of community programs. So when they leave, they have those other um, community partners for access for resources. Um, our funding stream too, um, we're affiliated with the Twin Falls County. Um, however, we're not funded by county state um, tax dollars. We're funded by a state contract from Health and Welfare, um, local and federal grants, as well as uh, donation services. Um, about half of the youth that are at the Safe House are from Twin Falls County, but we also are able to offer services to the eight county areas uh, within our um, region. Do we have any questions? No I questions? I think that's all. Oh, wow. Okay. All right. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Salvation Army. My name is Troy Cook. Good afternoon, council members. My name is Lieutenant Troy Cook. I am the commanding officer for the Salvation Army of Twin Falls. Today, the Salvation Army is requesting funding for our kids program, which is actually an underlying program within our summer day camp and homework club children's programs. KIDS is an acronym for Keeping in Desirable Shape, which meets the objective HC1 a that states that the city will provide affordable healthy lifestyle programs for children according to statistics prepared by South Central Health District the Twin Falls population continues to face substantial challenges with respect to individual and community health there are relatively high incidences of various cancers diabetes high blood pressure and smoking that are long-term health related problems for our community as well as the growing economic costs from such conditions According to childhealthdata.org, Idaho ranks 11th in overall prevalence with 27.5% of children considered either overweight or obese. The Idaho prevalence of overweight and obese children has risen since 2003. According to the 2008 Pediatric Nutrition Surveillance System, which assesses weight status of children from low-income families participating in WIC, 28.3% of low-income children ages 2 to 5 or overweight or obese in Idaho. In the United States, childhood obesity is responsible for a stag staggering $14 billion medical bill nationwide. The problem continues to affect these children that grow into adults who run or work for businesses, and it suffers the country a $4.3 billion loss in absenteeism. Needless to say, our program is battling this epidemic starting here in Twin Falls. The Keeping in Desirable Shape program installed within our Salvation Army Children's Program was started by a visionary Salvation Army staff in 2010, and our standards continue to be held to this day. Our goal is to teach the kids a healthy lifestyle, 
of good nutrition and exercise. The anticipated byproduct of this goal is to lower the incidence of obesity-related illnesses such as juvenile onset diabetes, which will directly lower the medical cost of this population. The Twin Falls Parks and Rec, they do offer great sports opportunities and programs to over 7,000 youth in our community and couple that with the 60,000 city pool users and some great results are taking place to fight childhood obesity. However, our Salvation Army program is offering wellness training as well as much needed physical activities. Our Keeping in Desirable Shape Kids program is an outcome-based program that uses charts to measure height, weight, and BMI to assess the data on the children. Our stats for the past seven years shows the good growth that our children have, decreased BMIs, and a bonus of increased stamina, balance, coordination, and elevated self-esteem levels. Our current year-round youth program budget is a little over $100,000 per year. Today we are asking for help with $20,000 of that bill. We have the lowest cost summer day camp and homework help club in the Magic Valley, but with the income received from the suggested donations, we still sit at a $76,000 deficit based on youth fiscal year expenses. Our 11-week summer day camp program offers great weekly themes such as sports week to get kids active and moving in a variety of sports, challenge week with our version of the amazing race, Olympic week that gets our kids active in mock Olympic training, in beach volleyball, soccer, tennis, and track and field, and wellness training from CSI staff that is accompanied by our On the Farm Week that teaches kids the importance of fresh foods from the farm and how they get to the stores and eventually into the homes. Our youth programs provide healthy snacks and meal options daily, and we also teach the importance of the arts with our Performing Arts Weeks where they perform plays for the community and our Art and Soul Week. In closing, the Salvation Army, Salvation Army personally thanks you for your past and individual support and request for your continued future support of our much needed children's programs. Are there any questions? There are. Chris Talkington. Well, Lieutenant, of the 40 kids that you want to enroll in your summer program based on historicals, uh, what percentage would you expect in the city versus out city? Uh, we service all kids that are in within Twin Falls County. So if they're coming to us, they, they live within Twin Falls County. Uh, last year we had 71 registered in our summer day camp program. We're projecting very similar numbers this year. Thank you. Any other questions? I think that's all at this time. Thank you very Thank much. You. Next on our list is Trans 4. Lynn Beard, uh, Director of Transport Buses for the College of Southern Idaho. Today I appreciate the Council hearing my request. Uh, we have uh, suffered about a $100,000 uh, decrease in FTA fundings this year over last year. Uh, we have made some changes to try to offset those costs, and that's money we won't be receiving. Um, one of the things we've done is I'm now a 60% employee, so mm -hmm. <laughs> that'll cut that down on the administrative expense sum. Um, as was pointed out in the transportation study that the, the, the city did last year, a demand response system appears to be the best option for Twin Falls at this time. The study says that an enhancement of this system could fill the requirements for when Twin Falls become small urban. Uh, as outlined in the financials that you have, uh, we, we suffered a loss of about $44,247 last year. The projected loss for this year is $80,000. Some of this loss for this year is the 20% match of the $267,165 that we uh, got an 80% grant to, uh, to update our equipment. So we have now have five new buses to so we can provide, continue to provide reliable service to this community. Um, without the uh, loss, I think that the loss for this year would probably mirror last year's. Uh, because we have done some things to cut costs. Uh, to answer Chris's uh, question, 99.9% <laughs> of our uh, <laughs> service is to the city of Twin Falls. It's probably soon to be 100. Thank you. I would answer any questions. Uh, 
you know, the, the, the less loss that it suffers, the longer th the college will be able to support CSI uh, to provide public transportation for the city of Twin Falls. Are there any other questions? Thank, Thank you, you very Mr. much. Sam. Next, we have the Twin Falls Senior Center, and we have three requests under this one, so I'll let you take it in the order you need. Jeanette Rowe. Thank you for having me today. I broke this up into three parts because um, what I've done is I've received match money on some of these projects and I just wanted to explain them. I thought it'd be easier if I divided it into three. The first one that I want to talk about is the fact that um, is for LED lighting uh, in, the, in the center itself. I decided to be proactive and see what it would be. Idaho uh, Power does quite a bit of incentives to uh, get people to get LEDs. It will lower the po cost of electricity to run the lights by half. So it is a cost savings that would be very advantageous for the center to take since my uh, electrical bill is one of my biggest utility expenses. So what I did, I've been proactive. We've already uh, installed lights in the main hall of the center. And what I would like to do is continue putting the lights in, in the center, uh, receiving the uh, rebates. But when I was checking on it, he also told me that I could have the lights on the outside of the building which the lights are in an area that are very hard to uh, replace. As a matter of fact, we can't reach them, so I usually ask if the city can bring a truck by to replace the light bulbs, which, by the way, one of them is out. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, always, we always supply the light bulbs and, and, in doing that, but what happens is um, they use an awful lot of electricity. The fact that the, the marquee that's on the front of the building, I actually have to leave it on most of the time because otherwise I forget to turn it on at night. So what's happening is that they're going to put photo cells on those who will automatically come on only when they're needed, so that will also help save. Plus the fact that they'll use LEDs versus this. Then we won't have to be changing the light bulbs as much because they should last hopefully up to 20 years to 25 years. So it should be a huge cost savings. So what I did in this first grant is, is I've already put a bunch of money in putting into it. Uh, I'm just asking for $750, which is basically what it's going to cost for the outside lighting not what's inside the center, um, to uh, make sure that the building is safe and secure from the outsides at night. So is there any questions on that one? Nope, I don't see any lights. Keep going. Okay. I'm not trying to rush you. No. <laughs> <laughs> the second one that I wanted to ask money for um, was we have a beautiful facility and everybody tells us how great and wonderful and how much space that we have that's in the facility. And that's, that's wonderful, but we're out of room when it comes <laughs> to our kitchen. And the reason for this is the fact that we served almost uh, a little over 72,000 meals last year. Uh, that was an increase of almost 12,000 meals in the year before. A lot of that increase was 11,000 of that is an increase of the home delivered meals which last year we served an all-time high of 53,000 home-delivered meals throughout the year. The problem is, is I need more, more ovens so we can cook more food at the same time because I have staff, but I only have a limited number of staff. And even though we've doubled the number of meals that we did three or four years ago, I haven't added any extra kitchen people. And, and what we would like to be able to do is like the baker, she'd like to be able to bake the bread and the cookies at the same time. The, the person that's in the kitchen doing the main cooking, she'd like to be able to get the meat products or be able to get the uh, next day's meals going in prep time. So what we're asking for is, is some funding to um, put new electrical in because the new oven would be a stackable, double-deck, conventional oven. So what will happen is, is I'll take the old oven out. Instead of one, we'll have two. So what I'm doing is, is having two um, 240 watts installed in the center because while they're up in the attic I'm only going to make them go once in preparation of adding actually two additional units so there would be two 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 units that are double decked so we would end up with four ovens instead of two and so the electrical is a big is a big part of it um, for the cost of that it's twelve hundred dollars for that and then what we'll do is um, I got received a thousand dollars from the Rotary Club to help with the project 
And so what I was asking for is to see if the city could possibly pay the $4,100 to help us with getting that new oven. Then what will happen is, is I will try for another grant and then I have asked my congregate members to help in matching. So what happens is when we get through the first one, hopefully we'll have enough funds to get the second oven. Any questions? Greg Lanting. Jeanette, I, I got a little lost on exactly what you're asking for. It's the total amount you're asking for? The total amount for on the ovens is $4,100. Okay, and so that goes and then 1200 plus 750 or? I know what happened is, is, is the 1290 the whole cost of the project is $6,417. Uh, what I'm gonna put in is 131775 was asking for 4100 from the city and I have $1,000 that I received from the road recov to, uh, to cover this part of the project. What happens is, is the salvage value of the oven that I have currently, I'm hoping that I can get anywhere from 1500 to or $1,750 out of it, then I will take it and use it to apply to buy the second oven. So it'll be 4100 plus the 750 then, or? So far. So far. Yeah. yeah. She has three separate requests. So oh, okay, can, so we got one more. We can do we got three. We, we got, you can shop them up into pieces as you see okay, need. So right. $750 was for the LED nice. project to pay for the outside lights, and this would be $4,100 to help pay for the new oven. Okay, and then we have another one coming as well? Yes. Okay, yep. I'm and sorry. I didn't inter interrupt you. I took some of your time away. I apologize. That's okay. I think I have enough. Okay, the next project is one that's been a continuing project. What we've been doing is in 2014, I applied for a grant through the Idaho Department of Commerce to do some major improvements to the senior center. Of that, we have spent, a pro it was $149,000 that we received, and we've spent about 138,000 of that. The last final piece of this project is replacing the sidewalks and making the front side, which is the east side of the building, handicapped accessible. And what happens is, is all the handicap accessible uh, signs and all that parking was on the west side, which is not feasible because you can't get the wind to quit blowing and the <laughs> fact that the foyer area has two doors, sets of doors on it, and neither one of those have handicap accessible controls on them, which the city says we can't do because basically you're gonna break the door off its hinges with the wind hitting it. Uh, if we try to put up a wall or do anything that way with it, you can't do that as well uh, because of snow and it just causes a lot of problems. So we've all decided through agreements with meeting with all the different agencies from the city that it's best to put the, par the handicap parking on the front side of the building and just relocate it. So we're gonna lose some parking spaces in the front, but we'll pick them up on the back side. Um, What's happened is, is since 2014, since we've taken a little bit longer to get the project, the budget numbers that we originally anticipated for it would cost in the project is, is more. The other problem is, is right now, there's a ton of contractors out there. This is a very small job in comparison to other projects. So we haven't been able to get a really reasonable bid in doing it. So we met uh, about a month and a half ago with all the different parties of the uh, city and we said okay let's all be on the same page on what we need so that's what we did and we finally agreed up with the design and we have it ready so we can take it out to bid but the problem is we believe that this is going to cost us a lot more than the money that i have but i would like to get this piece finished so um what we're asking for is i have eleven thousand three hundred and eleven dollars from the Idaho Department of Commerce that they can put into the project. We believe that it's gonna cost a lot more than that. So what I'm asking for is, and we think it, I had had an estimate last fall and it was almost $30,000. I think that's relatively high, but it was also we were trying to get in before the winter and trying to make it within the deadline. And, and I think the people bid it a little higher anticipating that it would, that it would be sort of a pain. That's why we waited till the spring. So what happens is, is I paid to have the trees removed from the front parking lot or in the flower beds beside the, the sidewalk. And the reasons why is because that was part of the problem. They were in the way, the roots were growing, and it was gonna be an issue. So I figured if I eliminated that from the equation, hopefully the bids would be a little lower. Um, 
So what I'm asking for is, is if, if we, you could help do 5,000, and I'm willing to put in the rest, so we would basically, the center would put in five, and you would put in five, because I've already paid 750 to get the trees out. If it doesn't go that high, I'm more than willing to give the money back. <laughs> I mean, I just, I just need to know, but we should have the bids here within the next two weeks to know where that is. But like I said, this has been a project that I think will last the center for a long, long time, especially over the fact I was looking at my numbers. Um, we have almost 500 people on a monthly, different individuals on a monthly basis that use the center. On a daily basis, we probably have close to anywhere from 60 to 100 people that use the facilities Monday through Friday. And what I wanted to show is you guys have asked in the past what I've done to the center. So the changes from before to after. <coughs> so as I used to tell people, it was, um, and it's a little hard to tell, but we used to have what I called mental institution green on the wall. <laughs> <laughs> um, with, with big pieces of foam to keep the sound and everything down. <laughs> and there was very little of anything that was there. And then we had those tablecloths that I said that y your grandmother used to have that nobody <laughs> wanted to eat at. So now we make this, uh, uh, now we have a nice uh, warm tan color put in. We've added some fuchsia just to make it warm and inviting. And then we've also bought new chairs with the impulse grants from last year um, that, that we put in as long as the funds that you guys helped us fund with the dishwasher. So that shows the main hall. And this is towards the kitchen area. And you can see the big difference. And it has made a lot of people, when they come in, they go, oh, I just had no idea that it was just so nice and so inviting. But it encourages a lot more people to use, utilize the facility. Is there any questions? I don't see any lights on. So I know that the, the funding is limited. I've always been very conservative in, in what I've asked for. So like I said, that's why I broke it up into three pieces. And if you need to make cuts where you can, I fully understand. I have a question then. If yes. we had to prioritize, what would be your number one request? The number one request is, is I'd like the sidewalk project. It has to get done. And I feel that that's our part, that we have to get that done. The oven part is, is, is critical, but I, I, I'll figure out a way. And the lights, like I said, 750, I can probably figure out uh, how to get that funded. Thank you. You're welcome. Sean, did you have anything before we bring up our last presenter? I do not, but thank you. Okay. Voices Against Violence. My name is Donna Gray, though and I'm the Executive Director of Voices Against Violence. I want to start off by saying thank you so much for inviting me to come today and having the opportunity to request additional MPOC funding. And thank you to all the community partner organizations for all their work with vulnerable populations and the way that they coordinate and work together with Voices Against Violence has made a huge impact this year. So I want to start by just letting you know what we do I didn't know when we changed our name to Voices Against Violence that I would find myself at the end of the alphabet <laughs> and at the <laughs> end of every speaking opportunity. And so here we are with a room full of people who are not here to listen to me, but that's okay. Um, so Voices Against Violence is a victim advocacy organization in Twin Falls. We provide 24-hour hotline, 24-hour advocacy services for victims, emergency shelter, seven days a week of case management and counseling, as well as multiple counseling groups and life skills classes in English and in Spanish. Um, the way that that process works is we get a call through our hotline and we immediately provide services, whether that's emergency shelter or connecting that person with other resources that might be helpful. We then meet with that person to figure out how to met how to best serve them. We come up with a case management plan that is meaningful for that individual, meaning that they set their own priorities. We don't get to decide what's important to them. Uh, part of being a victim of domestic violence is having all of the power taken from you. So part of the healing process for us 
is to give that power back every step of the way. So the clients are in control and we are there to facilitate their healing. Our shelter is a 90 day program. Um, and then during that time we work with people to find out what would be the best next step for them. We served 4,000 or excuse me, 1,488 victims in this last year. That number is up 17% from 2015. So that's been a significant increase. And I attribute that increase to the help from MPOG because MPOG funded for us last year our outreach program. And what that allowed us to do was it allowed us to pay somebody to go out into the community, give presentations and speeches about what we do, um, provide brochures, flyers, visits, meetings, and do everything we can to get the word out about our agency. So I am returning this year to make the same request because even though we do receive funding from various um, state and federal programs, none of that funding actually pays for any kind of marketing or outreach or anything that can connect the meaningful work we do to the people who need it the most. And so that's where outreach comes in. Um, in this next year, we have a lot of changes coming down the pike. Um, we are looking at a semi-permanent housing facility that we are thinking of taking over, which would expand the housing that we can provide to our clients by doubling what we have. Right now we can serve 26 individuals in emergency shelter a night, so that will double that number. Um, we want to create an education program that systematically works to prevent violence, not just reacting to it. And we also are expanding and creating a volunteer program so that we can utilize the hundreds of people that reach out in a year and say, I love what you do, how can we help more? So outreach is a huge link in letting people know about what we're doing so that they can either donate, donate clothing, donate time, donate food, donate funds, all of that is needed. In our next year, we hope to be able to provide four prevention education lessons a month, one meeting with a collaborative community partner, eight outreach material presentations, and two formal presentations. This is critical to the safety of our community, and that is how your strategic mission and vision meets ours. Any questions? <coughs> Chris Talkington. <coughs> Keeping with the other questions I've asked, Donna, the 1,488 people to be served or currently served, An uh, break down city versus county or outside city? We estimate about 65% are from the city of Twin Falls. Thank you very much. Any other questions? I think we are ready to turn this issue over to the council Thank to you. see where we want to start now. Mandy, do you have a spreadsheet like you did last year for us, or? Oh, look at that. I'm going to put you on the spot for a minute. Um, since this is Chris's first year of going through an impog with us, maybe you can just kind of give us a quick two-minute brief on what we do and you want to just kind of on the process that we're about to undertake yeah okay <laughs> <laughs> it's either someone's either um, people's favorite time of the year or their least favorite time of the year the hardest part about this Chris and those of us in the in the audience that are here joining us for the first time is that we have a limited amount of resources um, to cover their the requests that we've had tonight um, I'm going to make a few adjustments to this um, as far as requests because those a, a few of them were adjusted but essentially, um, this process now is about taking the information you received in the applications, taking the information that you received tonight in the presentations, and trying to figure out the best way to fund these proposals, again, with the limited amount of resources that we have available. Um, it's going to be a little under $200,000 in requests versus the allocation in the budget this year of $100,000. So um, in years past, we've had some 
discussion. People sort of started making um, suggestions of levels of funding, and we just kind of go from there. Thank you. Chris Talkington? Yeah, there, there are no organizations that are not deserving of some of our support. They appear to serve our city mission some more directly in uh, ad adhering to public safety th than others, but they're all uh, great organizations. But I'm wondering to the council, I would like to table this tonight <coughs> because I've heard things tonight that are influencing my decision of how much I would support for an organization. As I recall in times back on past on MPOG, when we get to dividing the cake, we spent hour, two hours at a time, and these are important decisions. And I, th I think there's value in putting it off for one week, reconvening the issue, and hoping our sponsors will be here. But uh, I'd, I'd like to uh, throw that out as a suggestion, but I'm not going to make it a motion unless I see more than one head nodding. Nikki Boyd. Mandy, we had, we're at, we're at a limit of 100,000. I needed to, okay, I, I remembered 80, I remembered 100, but I was doing the wrong math. Thank you. Sean, would you like to weigh in at this time? Sorry, I had to get off mute there. <clears throat> I, I, I would agree with Councilman Talkington if we can put this off a week to have a little more discussion. You know, I, I had gone through and kind of divvied up the pie as I, off it reading the printed um, submissions but uh, would agree that hearing some of the things tonight uh, trying to trying to stretch those dollars around if if that's possible to delay the, the decision a week Greg Lanting well I am too willing to wait a week I hate to bring these set people to have to come back again to for their to wait for their fate a week but uh, uh, this is a lot to process. I mean, like Chris said, everybody's deserving of some level. I mean, this, this is one of the hardest things we do each year is to decide this money up. And I will put the call forward for, since we're starting the budget. I don't believe we've kept up with inflation with this, this particular amount. I believe it was actually 121000 at one point, and I, it falls on deaf ears every year. Yes, sir. You know, I what, what did I get wrong? <laughs> So, so what's important to remember is the municipal band used to be a part of this process. They right. have been completely removed, and so um, we also had money going to Southern Idaho Tourism, and that has also been completely removed. Both of those um, uh, were moved into direct appropriations, and so if you take a look at the amount of money and you add those direct appropriations, the total amounts that the city gives associated with an MPOG S program is about $135,000. Still doesn't make my job any easier. <laughs> <laughs> I'll guarantee you. Uh, yeah, it, it, it's 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 hard to take a look at some of these and uh, uh, and know the other needs of the city and different things like that. I know that we will never be able to uh, allocate two hundred thousand, and the total amount asked for goes up every year. There isn't any doubt that the the, the more as more more worthy organizations uh, discover this and uh, uh, things that we end up giving money to uh, maybe not enough for them for everyone to do their job but hopefully enough for them to at least carry forth with their what they're trying to do and uh, go forth but I'm willing to way to work I would I would like to come back with a solid set of numbers I was like Sean I had a, I had a set of numbers but they, I they got thrown askew by today, by the by hearing the how the money was being actually used and uh, the numbers and some of those things. So, I would like to wait a week as well. Chris Talkington. I've heard a nod or two, so I'm going to throw a motion out to table the MPOG uh, funding distribution for one week. Second. We have a motion on the table, seconded by uh, I'm sorry, by Chris Talkington, seconded by Ruth Pierce. Um, I do have a comment, but is it appropriate to let Travis weigh in now, or do we need to make the vote first? Okay. So, personally, I'm comfortable moving forward with this. I feel like we've invested a lot of time. We have the folks here tonight. Mm -hmm. I hate to ask them to come back another week. It's not the end of the world. I will be voting against it for that reason. I, I think it's business we need to take care of, and we knew tonight was the night. We had the information in our packets over the weekend, and I think it's prudent to move forward. 
but whatever the council decides, so it will be. Did you have something else, Greg? Oh, sorry. Any other comments? Nikki Boyd? We had uh, an hour and a half set, right? We had till 5.30 set? I don't think we set a time. We were just starting early. Okay, I just oh. see the time on here, okay. And the so meeting's starting at 5? That, that was 4 to 5.30 for their presentations. Right, okay, so we've, we've so met that, but we don't have any more time allotted in the... No, we, that was part of tonight's meeting, but... Okay. I hate okay. to make everybody come back also, but... Yeah. Sharon, roll call vote. Sean Barriger. Hold on. Yes. Nikki Boyd. No. Suzanne Hawkins. No. Greg Lanting. Yes. Ruth Pierce. Yes. Christopher Reed. Yes. Chris Talkington. Yes. Motion passes five to zero. Before we go on, Travis, five to two. I'm sorry. Man. Go ahead. Yeah. Madam Vice Mayor, members of the council, we would ask that you uh, come in to a special meeting at four o'clock to make sure that we can cover this item as well. Um, I don't know if I, the balancing of the agenda, we want to make sure that um, we had anticipated that this work would be completed tonight when we're looking at, at uh, subsequent agendas, and so we would ask that just to be able to come in and work through that process a little bit early so that we can um, kind of take a look at the agenda so it moves uh, swiftly forward. Everybody okay with that? Yeah. Great. Thank you, <coughs> Travis. Mandy, thank you very much for all your work. and. I, I would like to clarify for the applicants, um, are they required to come back? My concern is we will have questions for them. And I would hate to not have them here to answer those questions. Okay. Sure, be advisable. Money on the table. I just wanted to clarify. Okay. Nikki Boyd? Can all of them be here or send somebody to be here? <sighs> So can we send out an, um, an email to all of the applicants and remind them Absolutely. this week as well? Yes. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. Everybody good to keep going? Mm -hmm. Okay. I need to. Yep. We're going to give... Um, those who would like to exit at this time a chance to get out the door, and that'll free up some seats for some of those standing in the back. With that, we're going to continue on with our meeting. Um, we did call the meeting to order earlier. We're working off a new agenda form, so I'm sorry. I'm, I'm trying to keep up with the new flow here tonight. It's a little different to look at this way. Um, first of all, we would like to confirm that we do have a quorum of the city council here tonight. We have six members in person, and our mayor is on the telephone with us tonight, so he will be able to weigh in and have his comments heard as well. At this time, I would like to invite anyone in the audience who would like to stand with us and recite the Pledge of Allegiance to do so. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Do we have any amendments to the agenda tonight? Uh, Madam Vice Mayor, there are no amendments this evening. 
Next thing on our agenda tonight is a proclamation. And we have a proclamation from the office of the Twin Falls County and the City of Twin Falls. A proclamation of the County and City of Twin Falls, Idaho, declaring Monday, May 15th through Sunday, May 21st as Police Week and Monday, May 15th, 2017 as Peace Officers Memorial Day. Whereas the Congress and President of the United States have designated the week in which May 15th falls as National Police Week, and whereas the members of law enforcement agencies of the county and city of Twin Falls play an essential role in safeguarding the rights and freedoms of the residents of the county and the city of Twin Falls, and whereas it is important that all citizens know and understand the duties, responsibilities, hazards, and sacrifices of their law enforcement agency, and that members of our law enforcement agency recognize their duty to serve the people by safeguarding life and property, by protecting them against violence and disorder, and by protecting the innocent against deception and the weak against oppression. And whereas the men and women of the law enforcement agencies of the county and the city of Twin Falls unceasingly provide a vital public service. Now, therefore, we call upon all citizens of the county and city of Twin Falls and upon all patriotic, civic, and educational organizations to observe the week of May 15th through May 21st, 2017 as Police Week with appropriate ceremonies and observances in which all of our people may join in commemorating law enforcement officers, past and present, who by their faithful and loyal devotion to their responsibilities have rendered a dedicated service to their communities, and in doing so have established for themselves an enviable and enduring reputation for preserving the rights and securities of all citizens. Furthermore, we call upon all citizens to observe May 15, 2017 as Peace Officer Memorial Day in honor of those law enforcement officers who, through their courageous deeds, have made the ultimate sacrifice and service to their communities or have become disabled in the performance of duty and let us recognize and pay respect to all of the survivors of our fallen heroes. It is witnessed thereof, and we have set our hand and caused the seal to be affixed, and it is signed by Terry Kramer, Twin Falls County Commissioner, and Sean Berger, Mayor of Twin Falls. Mayor, members of the City Council, and members of this fine community of both the City of Twin Falls and Twin Falls County. Um, I think to start with, I would be remiss if I didn't remind us all that today, or 78 years ago today, one of only two Twin Falls police officers was murdered in the line of duty. It was 78 years ago on this date that Craig Bracken was shot and murdered by um, a person who had done a robbery over in Filer. And uh, Craig Bracken and his partner encountered the two robbers right here in downtown Twin Falls and shots rang out. Um, and Officer Bracken lost his life during that battle. Today, as we are here in, in the year 2017, across our great nation, 44 law enforcement officers have lost their life protecting and serving their respective communities. We have been so far very lucky here in the state of Idaho in this calendar year that none of those losses came from our great state. Twin Falls is a wonderful community to police and it's a wonderful community to live in. Um, we have a lot of events that are happening uh, with Police Week and of course the, the public is invited. Uh, it starts off this coming Friday at the Senior Center. At the Senior Center on Friday they will be having a luncheon uh, and it is for retired law enforcement officers and their families and anybody who wants to come and support uh, that group. Uh, I went last year for my as, as a new chief for the first time. It was wonderful. There were uh, a lot of um, uh, surviving widows were present. Uh, uh, 
children of uh, Long's uh, long ago served at Twin Falls County, Twin Falls City, uh, State Police, and even other uh, areas around here. So it's a great event. That's at lunch on Friday at the Senior Center, and of course you're all invited. The other thing that we have happening is on Wednesday night in Meridian, and then Thursday in Meridian at the Idaho Peace Officers Memorial, which is located at the Peace Officers Standards and Training Academy there in Meridian. Uh, Wednesday night will be a candlelight vigil uh, for a remembrance of all fallen law enforcement officers in our country. And then on Thursday, starting at 10 a.m., is the statewide um, remembrance ceremony. If you haven't been there, I would invite you to be there. There will be several members of your Twin Falls Police Department uh, partaking in that, including members of our Honor Guard and our uh, motorcycles. Uh, officers will be doing some escorts during that event. And of course, that Saturday, so Saturday the 20th, right here in the city of Twin Falls, at City Park at 11 a.m. is the remembrance ceremony that we do here uh, for the Magic Valley. And there'll be law enforcement officers from all throughout the Magic Valley and our partners from uh, various public safety entities there. And again, I would invite the community, it is, it is free of charge. Um, it's just a, a good event to come out and, and learn uh, some of the history of our community and shake hands with the men and women who uh, are honored to serve uh, in the capacity as a, as a peace officer. So for that, I, I thank you, uh, Mayor, Vice Mayor, and Council, and members of this community. Thank you. The next item on our agenda is for general public input. And before um, I open up the microphone, I would like to remind the audience that the general input we have is only allowed on items that are not on tonight's agenda. So if there's anything on the agenda later tonight, this is not the appropriate time to speak on those issues. Um, we do ask you to hold your comments to three minutes or less and to please remember that this is a respectful meeting and used do self-control when you're presenting. Is there a sign-up sheet in the back tonight? So I think some of these might have be people who signed in on the MPOG earlier tonight. So we will go ahead. So everyone that signed up has um, an agenda item attached to why they signed up. Is there anyone here? that has an issue they would or a comment they'd like to make that is not on the agenda and I'll just let you come up in order. Seeing no one, we will continue on. The next item on our agenda is our consent calendar and I will turn that over to the council. Chris Talkington. Move approval is printed. Second. We have a motion from Chris Talkington, seconded by Ruth Pierce to accept the consent calendar. Is there any council discussion? Seeing none, Sharon, roll call vote, please. Nikki Boyd? Yes. Suzanne Hawkins? Yes. Greg Lanting? Yes. Ruth Pierce? Yes. Christopher Reed? Yes. Chris Hawkington? Yes. Sean Berriger? Yes. Motion passes seven to zero. Under items of consideration, the first item we have tonight is a request to adopt a city resolution which reaffirms our commitments to the 2030 strategic plan and encourages all residents, civic institutions, businesses, and partners to promote policies and practices that support a neighborly community. And we have our city manager, Travis Rothweiler.
Sometimes it's not technology, it's human <laughs> error. <laughs> so Madam Vice Mayor, members of the City Council, you have the resolution before you this evening. Um, the resolution um, has only has only been changed in one section, and that is up at the heading. And one of the things that you'll recall as we talked about, this is a resolution of the city of Twin Falls, um, and that's where that had stopped. And so what we did was we took uh, what you do normally in a resolution and you take the part that you are resolving to move forward with, and we move that into the title of the resolution. Um, we also took a look at some of the grammatical errors uh, for those <laughs> that were here, and we recognized that those were called Oxford commas, and so I might be a little vindicated. Uh, <laughs> so last week I was humble, this week I might be a little vindicated. Uh, but no, we did have members of our team go look at it. There were a couple of little things that we had corrected. Uh, we did reach out. Um, it was more to the form of a resolution that was causing some level of concern. Um, so right here you have a resolution and inside of the resolution it states that the City Council of the City of Twin Falls is reaffirming its commitment to the City's 2030 strategic plan and encouraging all residents, civic institutions, to businesses and its partners to promote policies and practices to support a neighborly community. We spent time last week going through the different parts of the whereas often referred to as the recitals. The recitals set the stage of the resolution and it talks about what's moving forward. And one of the things that is important that is specifically called out inside of the strategic plan is it requires partnerships. And we felt that in order for the city of Twin Falls and the community of Twin Falls to realize that 2030 vision that it hoped to achieve, it requires more than a single institution more than a single government entity to really work forward and create that sense of community. And again, that is embodied um, inside of our strategic plan. And so with that, the staff um, will stand for any questions uh, that you might have regarding the resolution that's before you this evening. Chris Talkington. I'm curious, Travis, uh, you and the staff, what numbers of public uh, comments have you received, verbal, written, email, do you have any idea? I guess you can include the people who showed up at the meetings here, but uh, has it been a, a deluge, a, a quiet tidal wave, or just a steady but light? What, how would you describe it? So I would say since the city council had their conversation last week, I personally have had three conversations. Um, I can't share with you how many other conversations had come into our organizations. The three conversations that I had were very similar to what I had reported to you uh, last week where um, they were um, representing um, both opinions in terms of, of this moving forward. Uh, and as, like I said, I spoke with three. One of the individuals was um, not aware of the conversations that we had been having and so this person simply said, share a little bit more. One individual was supportive and one individual um, questioned if this was a step that we needed to move forward with. Um, so the individuals that reached out to me were evenly split. As we reported um, in uh, last week's staff report, the number of individuals that had reached out to the members of the city's team directly through this process, whether it then through email, voicemail, written letter, or a uh, uh, random come into the office and personal meeting, uh, those were also fairly evenly split. I think the conversations that we've had here um, represented uh, maybe a, uh, a, a more uh, supporting group that had come to it, but I don't think that that necessarily states that um, know, from my perspective and the ones that I spoke to, I don't know if I could um, discount those who also had the private conversations. So I wouldn't describe it as a deluge of process. Well, the reason I bring this up is because I'm curious if we had not been hearing from <coughs> the masses, the, the, the quiet speaking 
flat, non-speaking people. And it appeared to me from what you have reflected that our two meetings, uh, hearing nearly 80 people, uh, that uh, that 80 percent in favor of a neighborly welcoming committee stands as probably a pretty valid representation of the public uh, sentiment and that's from people primarily living within the city of Twin Falls so thank you for that observation I'm just going to go ahead and weigh in and say um, I think maybe citizens reach out to those who they feel more aligned with because I can tell you out of the people that have walked through the door of my business to talk to me and the phone calls and the text messages and the Facebook comments I've received, I would say I have had 80% of the people tell me they do not want this resolution and 20% in favor. So it's really hard to understand exactly where the divide is in the community, but I think the divide is truly there. Are there any other questions or comments for Travis at this time? Um, I do want to make the public aware that, as we stated at our meeting last week, we are not going to take any more public comment on this title, on this um, item tonight. We feel like we have had plenty of time to allow the public to address us on this. I think we've all had a chance to formulate our own opinions and thoughts on it. So I will turn it over to the council. Chris Talkington. Resolution number, please. 2017-8. Move passage of uh, resolution 2017-8. I'll second that. We have a motion from Chris Talkington, seconded by Ruth Pierce. Is there any other discussion from the council? Greg Lanting. Well, I too had uh, reached out and uh, talked to quite a few members of the community. Um, I would say mine was probably about 60-40 in favor the people I talked to but like you said they're gonna they're gonna come and contact the person who voted the way they wanted to in the previous one so um, those who were against uh, most of the time if I talked about a few issues that uh, that I felt about it one this the one that talked about a statement in uh, to show that we're Twin Falls is not who the, the some of the media would like to paint us to be, and also talk about the fact that everything that were, is in the resolution is uh, already in our strategic plan, every last word. And we're, we're not aligning ourselves with the welcome city nationwide effort. I also told them very specifically that I know that some people worry that this is a stepping stone. I will never vote for Twin Falls to be a sanctuary city. That is my guarantee to anybody in the twenty city of Twin Falls that thinks that's what will happen. That will not happen. My vote anyway, I can't speak of the council or future councils, but this to me is just stating that um, it's who we are. And I like the fact that it's neighborly community. I, I'm, trying to, I'm a little confused. Kimberly's had good neighbor days forever and nobody's even <laughs> worried about that. But uh, uh, I believe this is this necessary and to those who say why I say why not I mean it's already just restating what we are who we are and so I don't have a problem doing that so I will be voting in favor Nikki Boyd well I I think there's actually a lot of common ground here because what we all want is for our community to be strong and to be the community that we want our families to live in and being a good Samaritan is taught at home and it's up to each of us to practice that the rest of our lives this cannot be forced it can't be required there's always going to be an element of neglect of crime and of apathy and we cannot control what is fabricated and pumped out through any source of media or even if we're playing telephone like in the old days we have no control over that. What we can do is practice what we preach, and we can be the good Samaritans that you, everybody in the audience has proved every week of all the wonderful things that we do for others in this community. And I think that says everything, and we don't need a piece of paper to say that's what we do. Chris Talkington. There are four reasons I'm uh, in favor of this. Um, 
had an interesting discussion with a dairy farmer friend of mine yesterday, and in short of five minutes, he totally convinced me that the welcoming community in southern Idaho has been the agricultural community. The dairy industry would not be in the position it is in, and we probably would not have Chobani if we were not welcoming people of different backgrounds and different uh, labor uh, expertise levels and training. Uh, the welcoming community and the neighborly community has truly been our ag community. Number two, I spent four years in the Air Force uh, fighting communism and dictatorship and tyranny to preserve democracy. What I've seen represented here by a very small minority of people is anything but preserving the democracy that's exemplified in our Constitution of all men are created equal. And third, I'm not a Bible thumper, but I do believe in the biblical admonition, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Sean, did you want to weigh in? Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, you know, Greg's comments are very similar to my experience this last week in talking to folks. I, I find that the, the words that are in this resolution are simply restating policies and practices that we as a city and we as a community uh, have celebrated over the years. Uh, I don't think it hurts to put it on a piece of paper and read it out loud and remind people that those are the values that we stand for. It changes none of our policies, it does not lay a groundwork for any uh, future activity that some may think uh, that we are up to. I think being able to celebrate our diversity in unity for a community that we all love uh, does not hurt. And to, to echo Greg's comment, those who ask why, I say why not. Thank you very much. Any other comments from the council? Sharon, roll call vote, please. Suzanne Hawkins? No. Greg Lanting? Yes. Ruth Pierce? Yes. Christopher Reed? Yes. Chris Talkington? Yes. Sean Berriger? Yes. Nikki Boyd? No. Motion is approved, five to two. Thank you very much. Next on our agenda is um, recognition of one of our city's building officials, and I'm going to say Eck and let Jared take it from there. How's that? Uh, that's not fair. <laughs> <laughs> you get the hot seat now. Okay, well, this will only take an hour. Oh. <laughs> so, uh, Mayor, Madam Vice Mayor, and members of the council, thank you for the opportunity to recognize Eck. Um, he's been a great addition to our team. And Eck, where are you? I'm going to have you come up here real quickly. I just want you to grasp how big this guy is. <laughs> <laughs> so we get many calls from contractors saying, um, can you send the Hawaiian or Samoan guy out to my <laughs> job? <laughs> but I'm proud to recognize that he was actually born in Bangkok, Thailand. Wow. And uh, came to the States in the 70s with his folks, and his folks are actually here with us tonight, so pretty exciting. Uh, Eck, Eck recently passed three exams. Um, nine hours of testing, 220 questions. And these are internationally recognized certifications. Um, he passed their international residential code for a residential building inspector, international building code for commercial building inspector, and plans examiner. Uh, he did this in all in about a year's time. Oh. I know colleagues in our industry have taken up to three years to do this, and X done it in a year. He passed them all the first time. So it's really a big deal for us. Um, he's got a Great attitude, great addition to our team, and I just ask the council to please join me in recognizing Eck for his accomplishment. Eck, would you mind introducing your family to us? Um, my wife, Holly, and my daughter, Lily, and then my parents, Tupot, and my mom, Well White. I'd just like to say 
say it's been a pleasure working for the city of Twin Falls this last year, and I look forward to many more years. We're looking forward to having you around. Nikki Boyd would like to say something to you. You can't, you can't get off that easy. Sorry. <laughs> It's nice to meet you. Congratulations. And I've, I've heard wonderful things about uh, working with you. Thank you for coming to our community. Thank you for being part of our city family. All right. Thank you very much. Next on our agenda is um, a presentation of the fire chief's fire challenge coin presented by our fire chief Tim Soul. Welcome, welcome. Thank you. Mr. Mayor, Madam Vice Mayor, and members of council, um, I think it's great that we just got to recognize Eck um, because I think, and to stand up here to talk about Captain Hutchins because the greatest resource the, the, uh, is, is for any organization is its people. And I get the chance to talk about Captain Aaron Hudson because he's done some really amazing things, not just for the fire department, but for the city and the community as a whole. So I wrote some things down because um, this is, uh, there's a lot of stuff. So um, there comes a time in one's career. So you guys have heard me talk, and so I'm not going to, I'm just going to ignore it. Uh, you guys have heard me. <laughs> <laughs> right? That's a problem. Anyway, so you guys have heard me talk about um, running EMS and all that kind of stuff. And, I th and the value that I believe it brings to the community, um, value added for the fire department, um, because we're able to do more for the citizens um, in, a, in a faster amount of time than they may have had prior. And one of the primary drivers of that was Captain Hudson. And uh, so that's really what I want to talk about, because since we've started to do that from the first of the year, not only have people's lives been changed, but there are people standing today who would not have been standing had Captain Hudson not have been able to do what he did. And he did this prior to my arrival. Um, so uh, I want to sh share some of that kinds of stuff with you because there comes a time, and I'll get back to my notes now, so there comes a time <laughs> in one's career, such as mine, where you have to take some pride, and as much pride in training folks to save lives and developing systems and programs that save lives. And you have to take as much pride in doing that as you do in actually being able to get and hit the streets and get your hands on and ride the trucks and do that yourselves and do that with your team. Fortunately for Captain Hudson, he gets to do both, right? Mm -hmm. So he's still riding the truck as, a, as an engine captain and he's still leading his crew, but he also has been developing programs and developing systems that save lives just as much. And so he gets to do both. Um, you know, Captain Hudson was one of the primary drivers in moving the Twin Falls Fire Department into providing enhanced EMS coverage. This required moving the department to provide EMT training for its personnel, um, and they did that last year in 2016. 24 personnel were trained at the EMT basic level, and four more personnel are being trained currently at CSI. Uh, when they're complete, 93 of our department will be trained uh, to the EMT basic level or above. Um, this was done as a result of his efforts and, and others, but primary, uh, Captain Hudson uh, was one of the primary drivers. And as a result, the service provided to the citizens and to visitors to Twin Falls in need of emergency medical attention has been significantly enhanced. The ability to, to develop Twin Falls' heart safe community, which is one of my priorities, to improve the response time for citizens with medical emergencies and the value added contributions by the men and women of the Twin Falls Fire Department has been a result of Captain Hudson's efforts. Captain Hudson began with the Twin Falls Fire Department in 1994, and he was promoted to driver in 2007 and captain in 2009. He became the training officer in 2015 and initiated numerous programs and cost-saving measures uh, during his tenure. But nobody can do it by themselves. Family is an important uh, contributor to anyone's success, and Captain Hudson carries on the fire service tradition for his family. His father, and, I, and forgive me if I get this wrong, uh, but I believe his fire retired as a chief officer out of Oregon. Um, and Captain Hudson is also obviously supported well by his wife Jennifer and his two kids, uh, Michaela, or I'm sorry, Mackenzie and Caitlin. Mm -hmm. I get that right? Got <laughs> <laughs> right. smiles so, anyway. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so anyway, please join me in recognizing and thanking Captain Hudson 
for his contributions to the Twin Falls Fire Department and the community as he receives the Chief's Challenge Coin for exceptional service. You have, you have to say something. <laughs> Only 20 minutes. Go ahead. So. All right. All right. Um, so first of all, thank you, Chief Soul, for the recognition. Um, my wife and my kids are definitely my biggest supporters. Uh, very understanding, all three of them. Uh, very patient with me. Uh, this process wasn't easy to get everyone up to the level um, that we got to. Uh, it took a lot of, uh, a lot of teamwork, uh, and it took a lot of communication. Uh, we, we actually offered this EMT basic class to, um, to our people on duty, uh, and it was ever-changing. Our instructor has two jobs of her own separate from, uh, wow. from teaching us, and so it was uh, a scramble almost every single day. Uh, my family can attest to that. Um, so I, I definitely thank them as well. Um, all the members of the fire department, I thank them. Uh, if it weren't for their hard work and dedication, uh, none of this would have mattered at all. Um, they're the reason that we were successful in, in accomplishing this. Awesome. Um, Greg Lanting. Well, I first uh, met uh, Captain Hudson met, uh, when he helped me through the Firefighter Academy <laughs> for elected officials, for the want of a better term, that the union uh, uh, allowed me to go to. And uh, uh, I certainly uh, learned a lot in that time. I, I didn't know you were married to Jennifer, and I had Jennifer a Long. I'm not, I'm not, I won't say. I had Jennifer in, in school in the past, okay, and uh, so I appreciate uh, you and your family. And I certainly, uh, Officer Cleagle was, or Fire Driver Cleagle, I believe, was the other person that was with us. And uh, I don't know whether it was you or he, but I was. It was towards the end of the day, and I was getting pretty tired. I had all that fire gear on for like eight hours. I felt like with a tank and some of the time, and I'm walking across the ladder truck to the top of a building. And I had an ax in one hand, and I'm thinking, <laughs> there's people wandering around down below there, and I'm going, this is not safe. And so I handed it back to one of the two of you and said, I'll just finish this on my own. Like, hey, and so we got back to the roof, but I appreciated that time, and uh, certainly that, that class, certainly, if any of you get a chance to go to that, uh, it certainly gives you a, a, a firsthand feel of what it feels like to be a firefighter, even if it's just a little bit. And I uh, certainly appreciate it. And that's, that, the tank was so heavy, I couldn't believe it. <laughs> I think we have gotten new tanks since then or not? We have. We have. I, I don't think they're any lighter, but we well, have. Well, okay, good. <laughs> all right, thank you. Thank you very much for all you do for the city and for all of the citizens. Thank you. Thank you. Next on our agenda is a request to adopt a resolution to destroy any semi-permanent semi Duplicate or temporary records from Sharon Bryan. Good grief. All the firemen leave. <laughs> Hope there's nothing on the fire. Okay, this resolution is kind of a cleanup resolution. As you know, the Hanson building and the, uh, the city hall building will be consolidating to our new city hall this fall. And so we are all proactively trying to get records scanned into our system so that we don't have to pack and haul boxes over to our new facility. Um, and so this resolution does just that. The Building Inspection Department is um, scanning um, all their plans and all their building permit files, and so as they scan those, they would like to get rid of the hard copies, and so that's what this does. Turn it over to the council for any questions or a motion. Nikki Boyd. I move that we adopt the resolution to destroy, it, do we have a number or anything? Yes, resolution 2017-9. That we adopt resolution 2017-9, which is to destroy any semi-permanent, duplicate, or temporary records. Second. We have a motion from Nikki Boyd, seconded by Ruth Pierce, to approve the request 
Is there any other comments, questions? Whenever you're ready, Sharon. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> Greg Lanting? Yes. Ruth Pierce? Yes. Yes. Christopher Reed? Yes. Chris Talkington? Yes. Sean's not with us now. Um, Nikki Boyd? Yes. Suzanne Hawkins? Yes. Motion passes six to zero. Next is a request to award a bid to Klepfer Incorporated to construct the preserved section of the Canyon Rim Trail. And we have Wendy Davis from our Parks and Rec. We've been waiting for this one for a very I long know, time. I know, I'm pretty excited. So <laughs> good evening, um, Vice Mayor and Council. Um, I'm thrilled to be here this evening to request the um, bid be awarded to Klepfer. The, um, Dave is here to talk about the bid process a little bit. I wasn't even able to attend the bid opening, unfortunately. I had another meeting, but um, we had three, um, three bids, and the um, amount budgeted all came in under, and this one significantly under, and upon EHM's um, recommendation, I would like to request that we award the bid to Klepfer Incorporated to instruct the preserve trail. <coughs> Thank Finally. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, Chris Talkington? Yeah, Wendy, could you describe exactly the, the beginning end of the preserve section? So the um, the beginning is, well, I don't know where the beginning is. Depending on which way you're going, <laughs> it'll go from <laughs> East Linden Pole Line to the jump site. So it's that section along the canyon rim and behind right. the um, pole line east subdivision on the north end of that property. But it's not property. the portion of the trail that connects with the canyon rim coming around Pillar Falls and kind yes. of. Yes, well, yeah. so there's a little tiny chunk that we are working on a couple of easements to get across. Right. So that part that steps up onto pole line, um, I think we have those pieces in place, do we? To, to get us from that across pole line east to connect to this next section. And will that be part of the bed project, the pavement project? We, it's our intent after the awarded bid to use the unit cost to change order that piece of it in. Thank you. So Wendy, we a couple weeks ago talked about some property owners out there who were purchasing property and wanting to trade with us. So does this bid include the new straighter path with less fencing, or was this on the original project before we got involved on property yeah, swapping? Dave <laughs> about that. So I'm not sure if that actually okay. made it in this bid. I don't know how to address that. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Dave Tebow with the EHM at, e at 621 North College Road here in town. And to answer your question, Madam Vice Mayor, no, it does not. Uh, this is the base bid based on the design plans that were available at the time of bidding. Any changes to the contract will then be issued by change order um, in order to incorporate those new alignments that have recently been brought to our attention as options or alternatives for consideration by the city. So it's a possible we could see just a little more price savings on this project then because we're straightening out some of those um, corners? Based on what I see on the, on the revised alignments is yes, that the, the quantity of fence and trail could be reduced and therefore there could be cost savings afforded to the city compared to this base bid amount. Thank you. Yep. Are there any other questions? Did you have anything else, Dave, you wanted to? No, uh, the bids were received. They were responsive. Uh, Klepfer was the apparent and obvious low bidder and uh, everything seemed to be in order in their package. We'd like to proceed with the notice of award and, and get back some of their insurance documentation and get them a notice to proceed and start construction as soon as possible. Do you have an ETA for completion? Okay, so within the contract documents, we're shooting for uh, completion by September 15th of this year. Great. Thank you very much. I'll turn it over to the council at this time. Greg Lanting. Do we have a dollar amount? I'm, I'm operating off of Oh, 698. yeah. How much? 698.626. I move that we accept the low bid of Clefter Incorporated to construct the receive preserve section of the Canyon Rim Trail not to exceed $698,626. Did I get it right? Second. We have a motion from Greg Lantin, seconded by Chris Talkington to, ex to award the bid to Klepfer Incorporated. 
Is there any other discussion? Sharon, roll call vote. Ruth Pierce? Yes. Christopher Reed? Yes. Chris Talkington? Yes. Nikki Boyd? Yes. Suzanne Hawkins? Yes. Greg Lanting? Yes. Motion passes six to zero. So we have one more item left on our agenda, which is um, a presentation. And just because we've been going for over two hours, and I know we've been trying to take a break, I just want to check with council and make sure everybody's good to keep going. I need to take a quick break. Okay, we are going to take a five-minute re- um, we'll, we'll reconvene at 6.15.
We're going to reconvene our meeting at this at 6.15. Look at that. We're right on time tonight. So the next item on our agenda is um, an update on the Main Avenue project from Paul Johnson with CH2M. Welcome, Paul. Thank you, uh, Madam Vice Mayor and members of the council. I'm pleased to say that work is well underway with the Main Avenue project. I'll keep this very short. We are on schedule and on budget, so we've got a great project team, I think. Everybody's working really well together, and Guho is well underway on the Gooding to Shoshone section, as you can see from the, the pictures here. Um, they have demolished the streets. They have left the sidewalks intact for access to the front of every business. Um, that's better than the compacted gravel path, I think, that I told you about before. That will need to come eventually, but for now, they're able to leave about a five-foot sidewalk section in front of all of the businesses, which improves accessibility um, to those properties. So that's a very good thing. Um, we did discover one unexpected uh, coal chute. Most of the coal chutes were, had shown up on the ground penetrating radar, so that was a good investment. We did discover one additional one, but we have some contingency for that. Hmm. Um, the last Main Avenue project was in the 1970s, so the timing is roughly the same, but we have not discovered Jimmy Hoffa yet. <laughs> <laughs> I tried that at the URA board <laughs> meeting. It's very dangerous for <laughs> someone from an engineering firm to try comedy. <laughs> <laughs> this picture is of the mock-up of the concrete pavers. That's at Guho's construction yard um, on 2nd and Fairfield. Um, so on April 11th, after the groundbreaking, we asked several representatives from the city and the URA to have a look at a couple of different paver options. And we selected the ones in the foreground. They're Holland stone pavers by Belgard, very attractive color. They have a slight bevel on the edge, about a six millimeter bevel. And we checked that out thoroughly to make sure that that meets ADA accessibility requirements. And it currently does. Um, so it's, it's a very good product off the shelf and allowed us to save $30,000 compared to custom cast pavers which have the square edges but don't pop quite as much in terms of, of color. We also, Nathan Murray with the URA uh, executive director went to McCall and he examined both types of pavers that have been in place for five to eight years and felt that the beveled pavers were holding up the best and uh, we think that's going to be a good option for the community. So as other businesses decide to add those to their sidewalks, they should be off the shelf economical pavers for, uh, for those projects. Guho construction began work around April 17th. Of course, we had the landscape demolition in February. One of the first things that they did was installed the electrical ca um, cables, the trenching and the cables from the Gooding um, Alley to Main Avenue. This will power the new lights all along Main Avenue. You see the red concrete in the lower left. If you're digging and you hit red concrete, please stop. <laughs> so, <laughs> because that means they, they are covering electrical cables. Um, the week of April 21st, they also um, cleared several of the areas with the underground voids. And then the week of April 28th, the full demolition of the first block began, and they're now into the second block from Fairfield to Gooding with some partial demolition there. Um, I had more details for the URA board, but probably don't need to go into anything else here other than a quick update on the flag displays, which the Lions Club likes to do eight times per year. So that requires sleeves in the sidewalks and you asked me to provide you an update at the next meeting. So we ran that by the URA board today and uh, based on input from the businesses and through the Lions Club, the request has come through to add sleeves in front of every business so that they have the opportunity to show that they are supporting the Lions Club with the, uh, the good cause of providing eyeglasses for those who can't afford them. Um, so those businesses would be able to re be recognized for that. So we are working on finding 
Um, the sleeve details are putting the sleeve details together. We'll discuss that in the project team meeting tomorrow, and I don't anticipate that that will be a problem. Um, we will make sure that they're in the right location so they don't represent any sort of tripping hazard. So we hope that that will be satisfactory to you. There will also be the flags available in the islands on Shoshone as there used to be, so we'll make sure the sleeves go in those locations as well. So that's a quick update, again, on schedule with October 31st as the forecast completion and on budget at just under $6.5 million. Great. Chris Talkington? Would you uh, reiterate uh, the looping water for uh, fire hydrants on Maine? I had a business owner ask me that over the weekend. I couldn't give precise information of locations or how many per block. Okay, there will be three additional fire hydrants on Main Avenue that were, that were not there before in the five block area, and that requires looping from the seconds. I'd have to study the plans in a little more detail to see the specific side streets where that looping occurs. Uh, but Every block will be served, though, uh, is that fair to say? Um, it would be located roughly between each block so from okay. one hydrant you could serve sure. two blocks so with three hydrants you know there should be at least six blocks of coverage thank you thank you very much Nikki Boyd on the flags the sleeves are all being provided by the Lions Club and is the sleeve marked as such we will be going through the details tomorrow uh, yes the sleeves will be Actually, um, my company has offered to pay for the cost of the sleeves, and we'll be working with Guho for installation to try to keep it, you know, a zero cost um, to the project. Um, the Lions Club would then take care of removing the caps each holiday and placing a flag in the sleeve. Um, I'm working with the architect to make sure that we select locations in front of each business that won't be a tripping hazard and will not uh, cause bumpers from parking cars to hit, uh, to accidentally hit the flagpole. So the furnishing zone is a, a perfect um, four foot area along the edge of the curb because if you come in from the edge of the curb four feet, you have the tree grates and the concrete pavers. So we'll have opportunities in there plus a number of landscape islands to locate those sleeves. So I can come back with a specific detail at the next meeting, but it should just be a PVC cap that is flush with either the concrete or the surrounding brick. Okay, so we talked about having like every third business, and so it's decided every business, and the purpose of this is for eight times a year on American holidays that we display the American flag. That's correct. Yeah, the Lions Club charges a nominal fee of, I think, $30 per business. And I think that having the sleeves in place in front of every business would encourage other businesses who haven't participated before to go ahead and, and chip in the $30 because the sleeve would already be there, and then they would have the honor of you know, showing that they support uh, the Lions Club and, and their good cause so, on the so eight this, holidays. This is a Okay, it's, it's sounding like it's a fundraiser for the Lions Club instead of a display of the American flag. I guess it's a combination of the two. I guess, yes, it would be a combination of the two. I mean, the Lions Club is, is proud to display the American flag, and they do that as a voluntary effort. Right, they and the $30 is per year? The $30 is per year, yes, and 100% of that goes to eyeglasses for people who cannot afford eyeglasses or for collecting used eyeglasses, identifying the prescription on them, and then shipping them to countries uh, that where people cannot afford the eyeglasses. So it's a very good cause, but the Lions Club does this 100% as a voluntary effort. I've learned, too, that the Boy Scouts and the Girl Scouts also do the flag displays in other parts of Twin Falls as a voluntary effort. Normally, it requires going to the sidewalk and drilling a hole uh, to display the flag when someone decides that they wish to do that. So in order to avoid that, we've decided to just go ahead and put um, innocuous sleeves in in front of every business to allow that to happen. But, of course, it's a proud tradition of displaying the flag that's gone on for many years. Correct. Thank okay. you very much. Thank you. I don't see any other lights. Thank you very much for the update tonight. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Next is any advisory board report.
reports or announcements from the council? Anyone have anything? Ruth Pierce. I just want to mention we have an opening on the Historic Preservation Commission. We had a member that needed to resign due to time. So um, the applications can go to, I'm not exactly sure, Lisa, um, probably. Kelly. Pardon me? Kelly. Kelly, OK. Kelly Weeks. And um, I don't know how, how long it's going to be open, but we do have an opening. So, And it's a fun little commission. Thank you, Ruth. They're one of the more fun. Pretty fun. Any other announcements? Anything from the city manager's office tonight? Okay. We'll move on um, to our public hearings then. So um, the first public hearing we have tonight is a request for annexation for 30 plus or minus acres of land proposed to be annexed with the zoning designation of R4, currently zoned R4, for property located at 248 Pheasant Road. And it'll be presented by EHM Engineers on behalf of John, and I'm not even going to attempt John's last name tonight. How's that? <laughs> Mayor and members of the City Council. My name is David Tebow with EHM Engineers and I'm representing Mr. John Zernikow. Thank you. And uh, uh, he's not able to be here this evening. However, uh, his father-in-law is in the audience and is residing at the property and, and uh, anticipating moving forward with this project. So um, I believe in your packets you have the description that that we're requesting. We're requesting that we annex property that is currently an island, completely surrounded on all four sides by the city limits of the city of Twin Falls. Um, it has a proposed zoning designation of R4, and that is what we would like the zoning designation to be in the event that it is determined that we annex this property. Um, the owners are desirous to develop the property into a residential subdivision. There's an existing residence established on the property at this location. And uh, this request for annexation and designation of a specific zone within the city limits is the first step of the development process. And uh, so that's why we're here this evening. Uh, with that, I'd answer any questions that you may have regarding the application. All right. Greg Lanting. Uh, yes. The, this is some of the area that we are, the city in cooperation with developers have been developing additional water um, supply in that area is this one was this area one of the was this one of the developers or is this just going to be one who will pay the developers <laughs> for what they so chipped in so mr lanning actually this is one of the developers that um he's going to end up having to construct off-site water to washington street at his cost and because of the additional water supply and the change in the city's uh, pressure distribution zones um, the city has currently put him on notice that he's going to be responsible to construct a pressure reduction valve at a very significant cost to his development in order to provide service to his development. Um, we're estimating that cost at a cost greater than $50,000, additional above and beyond what would normally be required um, prior to the redelineation of the pressure zones of the city of Twin Falls. Regardless, he's, his intent the intent of the developers to proceed with the development and hopefully work through the city and its payback agreements to recoup some of those costs. Great. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> we'll now have the city report from Steve O'Connor. Welcome, Steve. Thank you, Madam Vice Mayor and uh, Council. A little uh, quick history on this. This lot has been in agricultural use since 1950. The records indicate that the single family residence was built in 1959. And the residential developments to the south and east are part of the Golden Eagle subdivision, which is recorded in the mid-2000s. The applicant purchased this property in November of 2016. This request is to annex the 30.1 plus or minus acres uh, of land located at 248 Pheasant Road. The property is zoned R4. The request is if the uh, property is annexed, the zoning designation remains R4. Um, Twin Falls City Code 1015-1 and 1015-2 require hearing and recommendations from the Commission on planning and zoning designations for the areas proposed to be annexed. 
Section 1015-2A states the commission hearing shall not consider comments on annexation and shall be limited to proposed development plans and zoning changes. The city council shall then hold an additional public hearing to determine whether de the designation area should be annexed and if so, what the zoning designation shall be. If approved, an ordinance is prepared at a later public meeting and is adopted by the city council. Once the ordinance is published, it is sent to the state and the official zoning map is officially amended. Staff recommends the zoning designation of R4 to be appropriate for the entire 30.1 acre site and this would be consistent with the zoning districts currently found within city limits as well as being closely aligned with the current zoning of the area. It would allow for future residential growth along Pheasant Road south of Rock Creek. On April 11, 2017, the Planning and Zoning Commission forwarded a positive recommendation of zoning designation of R4 to the above mentioned property. All members present voted in favor of the positive recommendation. So in conclusion, the council is tasked with making a decision on the annexation request for the 30.1 acre site with the zoning de designation of R4 residential medium density. Thank you, any questions from the council? Can you remind us what, what is currently uh, R4, what that would mean to that property? That is uh, residential medium density. So it allows for single family and duplex with duplex with an appropriate size lot and then um, special use would be triplex and fourplex with appropriate size lots. Thank you very much. Good question. Okay. So at this time we will go ahead and open up the public hearing. Is there anyone in the audience who came to speak on this matter tonight? Seeing no one, we will close the public hearing and I will, t did you have any rebuttal or anything? Okay, we will turn it over to the council. Chris Talkington. Just a comment to follow up on Greg. So this is a very pertinent comment. Um, <clears throat> I don't think until we've been uh, upgrading the water system in our area, that could even be adequately served uh, a couple years ago, could it, Travis, for residential that they were built out? Here, I see Troy Vitek making his way up from the back, so we'll let <laughs> Troy yeah. jump into this conversation. <laughs> <laughs> Travis sees me a lot. Okay. So, <laughs> This is one of the few that, well, there's two projects going out there. There's a water line at 3600 and there's the Wells Booster <coughs> Pump Station. Nothing south of the Rock Creek could be accomplished without the Wells Booster upgrades that you guys are currently invested in. This one is uh, kind of because of the different pressurized areas. Any improvements they do to this area actually improves water flow over towards the high school. So it it is kind of separate from the water line. and. It's a reason they have their own kind of infrastructure they have to improve with the PRV valve. It's just to serve the whole area. So, yeah. thank you. Council wishes. Nikki Boyd. I move that we grant the request for annexation for 30 plus or minus acres of land proposed to be annexed with the zoning designation of R4, currently zoned R4 for property located at 248 Pheasant Road, care of EHM Engineers, on behalf of John, application 2855. Second. Second. We have a motion from Nikki Boyd, seconded by Chris Reed, to approve the request for annexation. Is there any other question, comment, questions or comments? Sharon, roll call vote, please. Christopher Reed? Yes. Chris Talkington? Yes. Nikki Boyd? Yes. Suzanne Hawkins? Yes. Greg Lantine? Yes. Ruth Pierce? Yes. Motion passes six to zero. The next public hearing tonight is a request for a zoning district change and zoning map amendment from R4 and R4 PUD to R6 ZDA for approximately four acres plus or minus to develop a planned fourplex development on property located on the south side of 18, the 1800 block of Elizabeth Boulevard. And again, we have EHM engineers. Again, Dave Debo with EHM. Um, We've been, our office has been working with city staff to develop this project and uh, at the staff's recommendation, we've determined that we would like to request a, a zoning district change to the R6 um, uh, zoning district to allow multiple buildings to be constructed on a single lot. Um, can I get that one up there, Steve? So the, the project consists of several fourplex 
residential dwelling units uh, without any delineation of lot lines, uh, which allows us to utilize the green space that you see here uh, in a manner with, uh, that's more desirable to the, to the developer, and then also to eliminate increased separation zones, um, which would then be um, enforced by the fire code uh, by the presence of a lot line and the potential change of ownership. So in order to facilitate this plan of development, uh, we're here to request that we request that zoning district change. Um, as you can see, there's eight units here in the middle, two down here, and four over here for 14 fourplex units. Um, there, this area here is in low-lying floodplain area, um, but is reserved for future um, building sites in the event that the floodplain issues can be mitigated or otherwise uh, dealt with. The channel, um, as you can see, kind of runs along this direction right here and then up and over uh, of the Perrine Coulee, which is this significant drainage right there in that location. Um, the developers are interested in getting these accesses from Elizabeth here and here as the primary access points for this project. At the planning and zoning um, hearings, we discussed the potential and the ability and requested the specific ability to work with city staff on um, uh, detached sidewalk and, uh, and attached sidewalk out on Elizabeth. At the present time, there's no detached sidewalk um, anywhere up and down Elizabeth Avenue or uh, Boulevard east of the project for five or 600 feet or west of the project for five or 600 feet. Um, there's an existing residence constructed on the, on the site right now and the vertical grade difference elevation difference between the adjacent property and the street is significant and so pulling the sidewalk away from the curb at this location for a couple hundred feet and attaching it back is going to prove to be challenging and still maintain uh, appropriate um, rises and runs so therefore we'd, we'd really like to consider keeping it attached consistent with the area that's surrounding and, uh, and keeping our pedestrians next to the curb there that is a, a difference or a deviation from the code required detached sidewalks on major collector streets. Um, uh, we discussed that with city staff and feel that we can come to some resolution as we develop the project. So that's, that's the project in a nutshell. We do have some neighbors on our east side here. Um, we're proposing a, a landscape buffer that we can buffer from them. Again, this is going to be a, a multi-unit, multi-family residential complex. Uh, screening, visible screening with some type of a fence or some type of materials is anticipated around the boundary um, in consideration of our neighbors. Thank you. Chris Talkington? Yeah, I'm familiar with the <coughs> original resident of that property and I was under the impression the whole area is a floodplain, but it's only that on the uh, uh, um, the west, I guess. Yeah, the uh, my understanding is Understanding is, uh, Councilman Talkington, is that the floodplain runs along uh, this location. This kind of gray line is approximately okay. where FEMA designates the floodplain. Um, in order to get that exact location, a flood study is going to be required to determine its exact location. But approximately, based on our topography, we anticipate it being approximately in this area. <coughs> but if we uh, act on the zoning request, is the city liable? if there is a uh, inaccurate or unforeseen flood plane situation. <laughs> I guess I'm asking what is the city's liability on what we're doing here? It has nothing to do with this process tonight, but eventually uh, they'll request building permits and they'll have to establish their outside the, the flood plane. Burden of proof is upon them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? We'll turn it over to Steve O'Connor again and let him present the city's Thank you again, report. Madam Vice Mayor Thank you. and uh, Council. A uh, little more history. This area was first platted as the Snyder Tract in September 1907. And in April 2007, the majority of the land in this application came under the Tuscarora PUD, uh, which currently governs the zoning and land use. Um, it currently has one residence, as uh, Dave pointed out, um, right here. And um, the, the rest of the land is vacant, though. 
this request is for the zoning district change and zoning map amendment from R4 and R4 PUD to R6 ZDA 4.02 acres to develop a planned fourplex development on property located on the south side of the 1800 block of Elizabeth Boulevard. The ap applicant is requesting R6 zoning to capitalize and utilize the available space in order to mitigate the effects of the floodplain in the area. The draft ZDA requests to depart from the R6 zone and that a maximum of 17 fourplexes will be built on a single lot, as well as specifically limiting the total number of dwelling units to 68. Per City Code 106 Zoning Development Agreements, development of a CDA shall, ZDA shall conform to sections of Title 10 unless specifically addressed within the written zoning development agreement and approved by the city. The agreement shall list all request variations from standard code requirements, and the council may add other requirements as they deem appropriate. <coughs> The applicant shall also provide a written zoning development agreement identifying the land uses and development that are vari variations to minimum zoning code requirements. The agreement shall also include phasing and specific development criteria desired for this project. The written commitment may include building heights as if greater than allowed by code, building materials, master landscape plans, specific land uses if not permitted by code, a lighting plan, parking plan, pathways, and other items as required. And the applicant shall also apply, supply a color master development as you can see up on the the Comprehensive Plan Compliance, Twin Falls Grow With Us 2016 Comprehensive Plan identifies this area as town neighborhood, and the town neighborhood is defined primarily as residential in nature uh, and supports higher density than rural and low density development to maximize open space and community areas. The applicant has submitted plans for a 14 fourplex building, uh, building project with a park area and an identified for future uh, development once the floodplain issues are resolved. The comprehensive plan specifically details the need for housing over the next 10 years, and approximately 2,700 new residential housing units will be need to built, uh, need to be built, with nearly 1,200 of those needing to be rental units. And that's per the page 26, 29 of the comprehensive plan. Uh, some potential impacts: currently, the four-plus acre site only has one residential unit, uh, so the the development that is proposed here will be a significant increase over. Um, the impacts will be a significant increase over what's currently being utilized. Uh, the westerly portion of the property shows three fourplex buildings within the floodplain. No building may occur within this area until the floodplain issue is resolved, and the developer uh, states his plan to develop the site within two phases. The impacts of this will be significant shift from current uses, uh, and those uh, impacts will be in the form of increased vehicular trips, noise, light pollution, and the ancillary, ancillary impacts from medium to moderately high density development. Despite the impacts which will occur over the entire period of the development, multifamily housing availability is of great need to our community. And the current comprehensive plan has called out our vision to provide a variety of housing types in order to provide for the growing job market and increase in senior housing as well as create higher areas of density close to downtown. At the preliminary presentation, the adjacent northeast neighbor expressed concerns, so this neighbor right here uh, in the northeast. Uh, expressed concerns with the traffic and the noise impacts to this development could provide uh, or cause on his property. Um, and Mr. Tebow uh, of EHM indicated that they planned on a five foot barrier surrounding the perimeter of the project. Mm -hmm. And city code 10113 states a minimum site obscuring screening shall be six feet. The condition to require the ZDA to place a minimum six feet site obscuring sound and buffering fence along the perimeter of the project would be appropriate. Although this is a residential zone, a complex of 68 residential units may have negative impacts to the surrounding neighbors. The side obscuring and sound buffering fence could help mitigate those impacts. Any lighting for the project should be downward facing and shall not glare onto the adjacent residential properties. The site plan shows a single 10-foot monument entrance sign for the project. During the public hearing with the commission, the, north, the adjacent, again, the same neighbor expressed further concerns regarding noise, light, and compromising the integrity of the existing trees on the property. Um, so there's a row of trees that um, are right here along that border. Uh, they're fairly large, very substantial trees. Um, and uh, so at the end of the public hearing, the commission held had deliberations regarding the sidewalk that Mr. Tebow brought up uh, being attached versus detached. And within, with the motion to forward a positive recommendation, the commission amended staff's condition regarding the, regarding the sidewalk along the front edge of the project, condition number three. Uh, the motion passed by unanimous vote.
So in conclusion, the council is tasked with making a decision on this request and staff recommends approval be subject to the following conditions. One, subject to site plan amendments as required by building, engineering, fire and zoning officials to comply with applicable city codes and standards. Two, subject to right of way dedication so that sidewalk is located in the public right of way. Three, subject to required improvements, curb gutter, curb gutter and attached sidewalks being installed within the first phase of development. Four, subject to a maximum of six foot, a minimum, excuse me, minimum six foot tall site obscuring and sound buffering screening fence built along the perimeter of the development. Five, subject to no development on the western portion of the property that is within the floodplain until resolution of floodplain issues um, uh, per the city engineering department. And six, all lighting shall be shielded and downward facing to protect the adjacent property owners. Thank you. Greg Lanting? Well, could you, uh, Steve, could you bring it back to show the overall zoning of the area, that very first one? All right, so that's R4 on Elizabeth Park Drive there then? All right, thank you. Any other questions for staff? With that, we will go ahead and open up the public hearing on this item. Is there anyone in the audience who would like to address the council on this? Seeing no one, we'll close the public hearing. Did you have something, Tori? You look like you're on the edge of your seat. Sorry. <laughs> so there's, there's a, I was just talking with Fritz about a portion of the code. It's unclear to me. I think that they have to comply with a portion of the code that actually says it has to be detached. Um, we can we could probably work through it. My um, my boss is very adamant about uh, sticking to our standards, mm -hmm. uh, and our standards are on collectors to have detached sidewalks. She also feel for safety reasons. Anytime you could relocate um, children in particular, she points out that is a middle school while none of the rest of the sidewalks are detached along that portion um, maybe sometime in the future they are I don't know so um, so do you need some kind of motion the motion from us to include that or let you work through it in the process we're asking that you would not include the part about attached or detached sidewalk in any motion thank you Dave go ahead <laughs> so I had just three things that I wanted to mention failed to identify and delineate the phase line. Here's the phase line, phase one, two being this western portion and phase two being the eastern portion, okay? The monument sign that was referenced is right in here at this location, a single monument sign. Um, a six foot high fence is certainly um, something that we are willing to com commit to construct. But in addition to that, what I was referencing is the five foot strip of a width of property uh, around that perimeter that would probably landscaped and uh, unencumbered and as a buffer to the neighbor to the west or does, east, excuse me. Does that mean those trees will be coming down then? You know, um, I can't answer that at this time, Vice Mayor. Um, we don't know exactly where the property line sits in relation to those trees. So Kay. the trees on our property we're intending to cut down and have begun to cut down several of them. Um, they're very tall. They're, they're mostly dead. There's a lot of dead in the trees. And uh, so anyhow, I don't know the answer to your question there just because I'm not aware of exactly where the property delineation is. I understand. Thank you. Greg Lanting. Dave, Elizabeth, Elizabeth right there. Uh, four lane, two lane, what is it? Is it three lane? Mm -hmm. Does it have center turn lane? Two, I think. I think it's a two lane, two lane street, one lane in each direction without center turn. So we'll be widening our, our portion of the street out to the collector widths and installing curb and gutter. And as we discussed, the issue of the detached sidewalk just kind of needs to be figured out. There's some real challenges with, with the vertical of the site. Do we know, either you or staff, that's why we have a few of our engineering staff here, or an engineer, uh, will that allow us to get to a three lane or uh, like a two lanes with a middle turn lane if would they widen with their portion? Right, so we'll know? be. I'm just getting a little concerned about 112 cars living there where there used to be two. 
So our yeah. property boundary is approximately from here to here. So along that frontage, we'll be widening the street from center line out to the gutter line is 24 feet um, collector. And so that's enough to get two 12 foot lanes in. And you'll have whatever's existing north of center line, which mm -hmm. appears to be sufficient for one lane. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions from council? I will turn it over to council to make a motion. Uh, okay, can Greg Lanty. Can I ask one more question? One more question. Uh, <laughs> Fritz, will we see, or Steve, will we see a ZDA back to us or just who will see it additionally? Or is it done with us? You'll see, it, you'll see the agreement, yes. Okay, all right, that's helpful. I'll stand for a motion. Chris Talkington. <coughs> Move to approve the uh, request for zoning district change and zoning map amendment from R4, R4PD to R6ZDA for approximately 4.02 acres plus or minus to develop a planned fourplex development on property located in the south side of 1800 block of Elizabeth Boulevard subject to the addressed conditions, the adjusted PNZ conditions. <coughs> I'll second that. We have a motion from Chris Talkington, seconded by Ruth Pierce, to approve the request for the zoning district change and zoning map amendment. Greg Lanting. Well, I'll be honest, though, this one's giving me a little heartburn. I, 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 I'm concerned with the amount of traffic. I mean, we're going from basically two cars to uh, one residence to what if it's 68 units what do you figure two cars for average so you're you know talking 130 cars or so there uh, where there were two before on it was the existing two-lane road and I just I'm, I'm not sure we're not going to have some issues there so I will certainly be uh, looking at the ZDA closely when it comes back just to see where we're what, what has been worked out to alleviate that possible congestion just another thought, is it possible to have a traffic study done on that road so we kind of know what the traffic flow is now or is that not appropriate for us to ask for since that's a concern? You, you can absolutely request that um, or they can provide it. They are expensive. Are they? Um, I don't know if you guys do it in-house or not. But just, just a thought since there seems to be some concern there, maybe if we knew what numbers we were looking at that might help alleviate some of the concerns. Yeah. Not not a mandate, but a request. How's that? Nikki Boyd? Isn't this the same stretch of road that uh, is very heavily driven in the morning, dropping off uh, elementary kids on the other side of Eastland over to Morningside? This is a real heavy they, they get tons of traffic in there at in the morning and, and at after school. So I don't know if the traffic is going to be that different with 30 acres now developed, I, d I wonder. Seeing no other lights, um, again, we have a motion from Chris Talkington, seconded by Ruth Pierce, to approve the request. Um, so Sharon, roll call vote, please. Chris Talkington? Yes. Nikki Boyd? Yes. Suzanne Hawkins? Yes. Greg Lanting? Yes. Ruth Pierce? Yes. Christopher Reed? Yes. Motion passes six to zero. With that, we are back at a point where we open up the time for anybody from the general public that would like to address the council on any issue that was not on our agenda tonight. And I see Max Newland working his way up here. I'm Max Newland from 328 7th Avenue East. And due to coming to these meetings, I learned that our people are first aid guys. I've got some skin in the game. <laughs> I was all prepared to cut this flap off. And the fireman says, no, push it back down. We'll save it. So I owe him big time. Thank you very much. Good Thank job you. Fireman. Thank you, Max. Is there anyone else who would like to speak tonight? Seeing no one, we are adjourned. Good way to end a meeting. Please give me.